Welcome, everybody, to the March 19th, 2024. Getting some echo here. Welcome to the March 19th, 2024, Tompkins County Legislature meeting. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we have the roll call of members, please? Deborah Dawson. Here. Rich Dunn. Here. Ian Corman. Here. Mike Lane. Here. Greg Mezzi. Here. Filler. Lee Shirtliff. Mr. Shirtliff will be arriving a little bit later this evening. Mike Sigler. Here. Shauna Black. Here. Travis Brooks. Here. Randy Brown. Here. Amanda Champion. Here. Susan Curry. Here. Dan Klein. Here. All members present. We have a quorum. We have four proclamations tonight. I'm going to read abbreviated versions of all four of them. And if there's anybody here to accept the proclamations, I'm not aware of them, but if they, oh, like there are, uh, hello, JR. Um, then we will have those, we'll hand those off properly. Um, so the first one, whereas in 1978, the school district of Sonoma, California participated in Women's History Week, an event that des designed around the week of March 8th, International Women's Day, which was a precursor to Women's History Month, and whereas Women's History Month is a celebration of women's history, women's contributions to history, culture, and society, and has been observed annually in the month of March in the United States since 1987. Therefore, be it resolved that the Tompkins County Legislature celebrates the brave women who fought to win suffrage, civil, and economic rights for women and designates the month of March 2024 to celebrate Women's History Month in Tompkins County. A second proclamation. Whereas Tompkins County recognizes the compassion of people in the community and reaffirms their commitment to care for one another in times of crisis, and whereas this generous spirit is woven into the fabric of our community and advances the humanitarian legacy of the American Red Cross founder, Clara Barton, who was one of the most honored women in our country's history, who nobly dedicated herself to alleviating suffering. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Tompkins County Legislature does hereby proclaim March 2024 as American Red Cross Month in honor of those who led with their hearts to serve people in need and we ask Tompkins County to join in this commitment to strengthen the community. Okay, the next proclamation. Whereas the month of March celebrates Women's History Month, an annual celebration of achievements and contributions of women in various fields, and Whereas, women have served in this nation's military since the American Revolution, ranging from supportive roles initially, initially to various ranks among the senior, senior leadership in this current time. Now, therefore, be resolved that the Tompkins County Legislature hereby recognizes Women Veterans Recognition Day in Tompkins County on March 18th, 2024, and accordingly encourages all residents to pay honor and tribute to our women veterans, past and present, for their unflinching determination to serve our nation in pursuit and defense of the freedom our society enjoys. Um, JR, are you good? Very good. And then the last proclamation for tonight. Whereas on March 29th, 2024, our nation will recognize National Vietnam War Veterans Day, a day to honor all those who served in and during the Vietnam War and who sacrificed along with their families and caregivers. And whereas 
This date marks the day in 1973 when the last 2,500 American combat tro troops were withdrawn from the battlefields in Vietnam, the last of acknowledged prisoners released from Hanoi. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Tompkins County Legislature does hereby proclaim March 29, 2024, as Vietnam Veterans Day in Tompkins County and urges all residents to respectfully acknowledge and thank all service members of this era, along with their families and caregivers, for their courage, devotion, service, and sacrifice. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Good everybody. Evening. Good, evening. <laughs> All right. Good evening, and thank you for these, uh, both of these proclamations. Uh, one was a little bit behind because the calendar shifted <laughs> on me, but um, the first was the in recognition of women veterans recognition. Um, we had an event last night, and our, uh, the New York State Department of Veteran Services Commissioner, uh, Ms. Viv Reverend Viviana de Cohen came down and was our speaker, and she really lit the crowd on fire. It was really great. She talked uh, particularly about the resiliency of women veterans and how it's just that, that fortitude of motherhood, of women, of um, just the sense of urgency of looking beyond just the next moment. One of the things she talked about was just that uh, uh, women know how to take two grains of rice and not only feed their family, but feed the neighborhood and just knowing that no is not an option. And she really fired people up with that. And she also, for all of us, all the veterans in there, really talked about service, uh, saying that service is the highest, um, service is the highest gift that you can give to your fellow, your fe fellow human being. Uh, meaning that it doesn't matter. One of the things for veterans, a lot of us don't like to hear thank you for your service because for various reasons. But she said that no, we should feel thankful when people say that because we basically supplanted our sense of comfort so that other people can have, stay home and have theirs. And so when you think about it that way, that, that is true. That is something that, for whatever reasons, we answered the call to serve our country and it allowed other people to be able to stay home and not have to deal with the other things that those in service did. So she really fired us up. She had people, somebody said they'd ready to re-enlist because she really spoke to about how, as veterans, our job is even though we did our time in service and our enlistment, a lot of us took away from that, that sense of service to our humankind, to our uh, communities, and that we all still continue to give and we all will continue to give. So thank you for that. And then the <laughs> other thing for Vietnam Veterans Recognition Day is that this is an event that happens, uh, it's been about seven, 2017 was the first time it was officially signed into law as a day to actually give a welcome home to a lot of the Vietnam veterans who never had a welcome home. Uh, and this is for the Vietnam veteran, Vietnam era veterans, no matter where they served in the world, if they wore a uniform and they served between um, 1955 and 1975, sorry, 59 and 75, um, that they are to be appreciated just because they were willing to stand there. You don't have a choice of where you get deployed to always, but you are there in uniform and you're to be ready to do whatever the country calls for you at that time. And so this is a event is something that's been um, designed to help give that veterans that thank you, that welcome home. And this is our first, of, our first event here in Tompkins County. And I feel privileged to be in a position to help bring this welcome home to our veterans. So, and one of the things Mama V said is, have to change our language from saying veterans to saying prior service. Because a lot of people who wore the uniform will never say that they're a veteran because they weren't in combat. And veteran basically means that you serve in the military. So just as a reminder to you, when you say veterans, I'm telling myself this too, that sometimes people will say no or not respond to veteran, but they will respond to, did you serve in the military? So there's a lot more of us out there than we think. So thank you everybody for both of these, and they will be hung with a lot of pride. Appreciate you. Thank you, JR. We will have um, multiple executive, uh, executive sessions tonight with multiple topics, and I will announce what those are when it gets closer. I don't think there's any other reordering of business. And we are up to privilege of the floor. 
Oh, I'm sorry, before we leave the proclamations, I just wanted to mention that, you know, we didn't read the, the full proclamations tonight. They are on our website. Um, they are in our agenda packet, so they can be accessed by everybody. Okay, privilege of the floor for the public. This is a chance for members of the public to come and talk with us about anything they would like. So I'm gonna read the rules that you have agreed to, to to speak here tonight. I agree to a three minute time limit. I agree not to raise my voice. I agree not to use lewd, obscene, profane, slanderous, or libelous language, or speak or act in a manner that would tend to incite a breach of the peace. I agree not to speak about county personnel matters. Personnel matters include comments about the job performance of named county employees other than elected officials. After three minutes, I agree to leave the microphone and yield the floor. Transferring time to another person is not permitted. I agree that if I cause a disruption and I'm asked to leave, I will leave the chambers. So I already have a few people that have signed up. If there's anybody else in the room that wanted to speak under privilege of the floor tonight, in the back of the room, you'll find these blue forms. Fill it out, bring it up, and we'll, we'll get you in line here. First up, um, District 7, the best, you know, this wonderful district that includes Danby, Caroline, and a little piece of the town of, Car of Ithaca, um, is represented here tonight by someone from that little piece of the town of Ithaca. So Claire Peters, come on up, and friend. <laughs> Hi, my name is Claire Peters, and I am a class two wildlife rehabilitator, and I'm also the executive director of Wild by Nurture Wildlife Rescue. We're a 100% volunteer run wildlife rescue um, here in Ithaca, and we rescue, rehabilitate, and release many hundreds of wildlife every year. Um, they come to us from members of the public mostly and also Cornell Wildlife Hospital. Uh, Claire, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you just tilt the microphone up slightly? It'll, it'll <laughs> register a lot better. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, so they come to us from members of the public. They find animals that are orphaned, injured, or sick, and then they go to Google to find help for them. So we take these animals in. Most of them are able to be released back to the wild where they belong. Um, and then we also have a special license to provide permanent sanctuary <laughs> to those who cannot return to the wild. Like this little one here, she was found as a tiny baby um, and has some issues due to nutritional deficiencies because her finder kept her for a period of time. So these animals help us to educate the public via social media, events around our area on how to coexist with wildlife and how to manage wildlife-human conflicts. Um, so let's see. We are currently run out of my home, but we have very much outgrown our space. Um, and we're looking to our community to figure out options and ways to expand and create a much needed wildlife center. Um, we rely solely on donations. There's no government funding. Um, so we're hoping the community can maybe help us to find a place where we can continue to save all of these lives. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Brian Eden. That's what I was going to say. As they say in the business, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> yes, yeah, a very worthwhile uh, uh, activity. So anyway, I'm here to talk about uh, uh, and support Resolution L. The governor's executive budget is a 144-page document with many items addressed in only one paragraph. It's voluminous and complex. You may be fairly familiar with the state's share of Medicaid spending, probably not so much with the myriad of environmental matters covered there. The Climate and Sustainable Energy Advisory Board, in serving its assigned function to advise the legislature, vets those climate-related items that may be of importance to county residents and municipalities. NYSERDA recently released a well-resourced study on a climate impacts assessment. Municipalities will be required to spend increasing taxpayer funds on the repair of storm damage and investing more in climate resiliency of its infrastructure. Surveys of selected municipalities have demonstrated that such costs frequently exceed the capacity of local government to adequately fund their remediation. 
The most substantial climate spending proposal in this year's budget is the Climate Change Superfund Act, which would impose a fee on fossil fuel companies for their past carbon emissions. Legislators, legislators estimate that the measure would raise $3 billion annually from fossil fuel companies to be spent on climate adaptation projects. It's modeled after the federal Superfund law that requires polluters to clean up the environmental messes they made. Similar legislation has been proposed in three other states. Big Oil long knew of the danger posed by climate change and yet covered up that knowledge even as it filled the air with carbon and methane while raking in record profits year after year. New York taxpayers will be on the hook for billions of dollars due to the worsening climate catastrophe. The status quo means a more hazardous environment, hotter schools, staggering costs resulting from more intense storms and flooding. Why not make Big Oil pick up at least some of the tab? After all, they made the mess and they have the money and must be made to share the climate cost. Or should the taxpayers shoulder the entire burden? Won't the costs be passed on to consumers? No. The Climate Change Superfund Act is not a carbon fee. It is not, in fact, a tax at all. It does not increase the marginal cost of production or otherwise regulate the current and future business activities of those companies or the products that they sell. Instead, the assessment issued to the companies are based on damages re resulting from past activities. Textbook economics teaches that such costs are borne by the corporation, not passed through to consumers. This is much like the tobacco settlement agreement entered into November 1998 between the four largest United States tobacco companies and the attorney generals of 46 states. The state settled the Medicaid lawsuits against the tobacco industry for recovery of their tobacco-related health care costs. In exchange, the companies agreed to curtail or cease certain tobacco marketing practices, as well as to pay in perpetuity various annual payments to the states to compensate them for some of the medical costs of caring for persons with smoking-related <laughs> illnesses. So anyway, I don't know how many of you have been on this side of the microphone, but trying to take a complex matter and reduce it to three minutes and make any sense and convince people that don't much about the issue, it's difficult. So as always, I've kept my, I'm always open to talking to people more extensively about any of these. I know Randy had some questions. I'm always glad to answer those, so please get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Nancy Raza. This is easy for me. I hope I don't offend or feel host get hostile. That's my, not my intention when I read your words. But I do have the mantra of there's some things worth going to jail for, but nothing worth going to hell for. <laughs> so to start, I'm going to have to read it because my blood pressure is up. Thank you for the opportunity to address the legislature. I would also like to thank those who have replied to my previous conversations. Nate's Floral Estates is a mobile home park whose residents are 55 plus years of age. We make up a vast spectrum of both blue and white collar workers, as well as basic homemakers. I am a retired microcomputer specialist who worked 24 years at a nearby school district. The citizens and common council work tirelessly on the local encampment policy encampment policy. In the end, it was deemed that the property behind Lowe's was designated as a non-encampment red zone, particularly for the safety of the residents of Nate's Floral Estates. I've just been updated on the fact that this policy has been tossed. My frustration, anguish, and pure bewilderment leave me dead in my tracks. We chose this park to have peace of mind and to be among somewhat fragile to support one another. In reality, not so. We spend our days on guard for intruders, continuously breaking our fencing, vandalizing and burglarizing our property. The so-called man with the chain and sometimes machete walks our streets at will. We are defenseless because the IPD has not been given marching orders to enforce or protect us. It has been said time and time again, mental health instances are taken to CMC, processed, and escorted back to society. Don't get me wrong, we feel for these people, though for the grace of God go I. But why do we have to live in fear? 
There are certain streets in Ithaca I try to avoid because I'm afraid of stray bullets. Why do you allow our citizens to be terrorized? Give our first responders, specifically the IPD, their just due to enforce and protect the citizens of Ithaca. Enough is enough. Our police, EMTs, judges, yes, each of our elected officials, the powers that be, or are, are ordained for good. Bring back some civility to our community and for goodness sakes, clean up the out of control trash on our properties. I am 71, but I never thought I'd have to advocate for my own safety. Thank you. Next up, Zach Wynn. Uh, good evening, folks. My name is Zach Wynn. I live here downtown. Uh, the new TCAT fair collection system that was activated in August of 2023 is not functional. Ithaca City Hall and TCAT Director Scott Vanderpool have been aware of this since at least last December uh, when I told them about it. Card swipe, uh, cards swipe through regardless of their value and do not deduct rides. This represents an ongoing loss of revenue that is incalculable. This system costs $1.5 million. TCAT is free to ride, just as the people from FreeCat free Cat were demanding. Due to this, TCAT is continuously hemorrhaging money. I am linking you to a Twitter thread from an Ithaca College journalism student regarding this issue. Her investigation confirmed exactly what I have just told you. I think spending $1.5 million on a system that does not work while pretending everything is fine is typical of how things operate in this community. Next time TCAT comes rattling their cup asking for money, please ask for an accounting of how much has been lost due to the broken fare collection system. I am including in an email drone photos taken recently of Jungle Number no. 1 by Agway. You can see dozens of propane cylinders, many of them stolen from Nate's Floral Estates residence. This location is the site of ongoing criminal and drug activity. The garbage is spoiling the inlet. Also included are pictures of holes that have been cut in the fence behind Nate's Floral Estates by residents of the drug encampments directly behind the park in Jungle Number no. 2, which you can see in the photos as well. This place is where Thomas Rath was kidnapped from before he was murdered. People crawl through these holes at night to terrorize the park. I was down there speaking with people recently and I heard numerous accounts of theft and burglary. People are living in terror. They are surrounded on all sides by drug encampments in the inlet. The city has completely abandoned, abandoned its obligation to provide safety and enforce the law. There is no reason to believe anything is going to change apart from getting worse. The recent overdose death by the inlet is only, is only the most recent loss of life. Someone from the park is going to be hurt or killed in a break-in. Conversely, one of the many armed people in the park will someday force to be defend them, forced to defend themselves. With spring on the horizon and code blue ending in less than a month, the population of the jungle is certain to grow very soon. The result of this pop the return of this population will bring with it more theft, violence, fires, and overdoses. The city's unsanctioned encampment area behind Walmart is a no man's land. There is no water, electricity, buildings, or infrastructure of any kind. The city's plan to direct people to this area, uh, to live in this area, is incredibly irresponsible and tantamount to murder. I asked. I ask you to please do whatever you can as legis legislators to hold the city of Ithaca to account for its lack of action to address this crisis. I implore you to take this issue out of the city's hands entirely and deal with it once, for, once and for all. As the activity at staff on State Street was addressed with a fence, so too could the issues faced by residents of the park. Allowing this situation to fester is a choice, with the residents of Nates left to suffer the consequences. You would not tolerate this activity in your own neighborhood. Why should they? If no help is coming and the residents of Nates are on their own, the city and the county should just come out and say it so people can fend for themselves. Act now before someone else dies. Next up is Lori Kowinski. Good evening, members of the legislature. Always an honor to speak with you. I'm here to stand with my colleague Brian Eden and others in the environmental advocacy community who will be uh, uh, being written, doing written testimony as well as Zoom testimony uh, to ask for your support of the resolution this evening on the slate of very important environmental bills that's been introduced to our state legislature. In particular, I'm here to highlight one of the bills that I've been uh, part of the effort to work on for a couple years now. It's called the Bigger Better Bottle Bill. Sometimes we can get that out without messing that up. As you probably know, I work for Catholic Charities here in Tompkins County and our agency serves thousands of marginalized and vulnerable people every year. 
And as you probably know, most of our programs deliver direct services to clients in need. But our mission also includes the mandate to advocate for social justice and human dignity. And that's part of my work and that's why we stand in support of environmental legislation and in particular this bill. The bottle bill originally was passed some 40 years ago in our state. And it has proven to be extremely effective. It has re helped reduce roadside litter by 70% and increase recycling rates. But as we all know, the five cent deposit on containers that was legislated in 1982 just isn't worth what it was 40 years ago. So this update of the bottle bill would increase the deposit on our returnable containers from that little nickel to 10 cents. And it would expand the kinds of containers that require a deposit to include sports drinks, tea, wine, liquor. One reason we're so in favor of this bill is that it would bring a well-deserved increase in wages for the marginalized New Yorkers who redeem containers as part of their livelihood. What they call canners are often immigrants or people with disabilities who are performing a valuable service for their communities. They reduce litter in the neighborhoods and they keep recyclables out of the landfill. And these people deserve a raise. The bill would also assist in addressing climate change. We know that trash buried in landfills produces greenhouse gas emissions. The less material we bury and the more we reuse, the more likely it is that we as a state can reach our climate goals. The bottle bill is a straightforward step in the right direction. It would save us money. It is estimated that New York municipalities will save up to $70.9 million with the expansion of the bottle bill. Part of that is because of the economics of recycling. We know that glass is often irredeemable once it hits that recycling bill because it breaks and then it's just con con considered a contaminated bin. And also the cost of recycling of containers are sometimes higher than what municipalities get back for them. So this bill would put responsibility for those containers back to the initiators, the, the uh, personnel, that, the, the companies that make them. So I appreciate your time and I hope you'll support that resolution in, uh, in honor of all of those good bills that are, we hope our legislature passes. Thank you. Thank you. We also have some people on Zoom that wanted to speak under privilege of the floor. Okay, so the first speaker is long, former longtime Tompkins County legislator and former chair of the Tompkins County legislature, and now volunteer member of the case board, Martha Robertson. Hello, folks. Uh, great to see you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I wanted to also speak in favor of Resolution L. Uh, as, as you know, you have another resolution H on your agenda, uh, sort of telling the state what you'd like them to do with respect to mandates. Uh, just like that, this is an important measure that, that helps you, that lets you weigh in on really critical issues that that will matter at our local level. It's not just about somewhere out there in the state, but if these bills are able to get through the legislature and be signed, uh, they will help Tompkins County meet our own climate uh, climate goals as well. So um, as Brian said before, the uh, resolutions, the resolution picks out some, the key, most important measures. They're related to each other in many ways. Um, and the case board really vets all these and we've selected the ones that really need to pass this year. Um, I would make a couple of specific notes. Uh, I did watch part of the peak meeting where you discuss these, uh, these bills. Uh, the climate education uh, bill, the P-12 education bill, I think is critical. We see kids these days, we're starting to hear about climate anxiety and really depression. I think that's realistic. I think if we have a curriculum in each school in the state, we will give kids more information and help them understand solutions as well. I think it will help with our kids' mental health. Um, I also heard that sort of gas is not as bad as we think. There are a couple here, a couple of bills that relate to the gas infrastructure and getting off of fossil gas. Um, in fact, gas is worse than we used to think. Um, compared to carbon dioxide, the science has been proven. Carbon dioxide uh, is, is damaging, but 
over a 20 year time scale, gas is 86 times more damaging than carbon dioxide. So we need to transition off of gas as soon as possible. We do not have time to wait. Um, and I think in general, the, the Superfund Act and the Stop Climate Polluters Act, we are already paying the cost of the damages um, that fossil fuels have created. So we're already paying for that right now. These bills will simply uh, expect and demand that the fossil fuel industry in New York State will pay part of the share as well. We'll bear some of that responsibility. Why should residents and taxpayers pay for all of it? I think the industry needs to accept responsibility for what they uh, have created. So uh, I encourage you to support this tonight. The timing is critical because, as we know, they're going through negotiations this month. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your support of this resolution. Thank you. Next up, also remotely speaking with us, is Dave Bulatek. Here we go. Okay, Sarah. Hi, my name is Dave Bilotek. I'm a resident of Nate's Floral Estates. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Is, can you hear me? I can't. Yes, I, you're I, good. I Keep, yep, thank anything. you. Anyway, Nate's Floral Estates is a zone manufactured home park of more than 100 senior citizens. Increasingly, over the last five years, the residents of Nate's have endured some break ins, physical assaults, threats, vandalism thefts, broken fences, on-site drug deals, aggressive roaming pit bulls, and trash, including shopping carts and needles. The seniors here have enough struggles without this added burden. In case you are not aware of our location, Nates is immediately to the west of Wegmans, sandwiched between Jungle 1 off of Cecil Malone Drive and Jungle 2 behind Nates and Walmart. In both cases, these jungles are literally adjacent to Nate's. In addition, Art House, which has housed some of the homeless and has hosted weekly police calls, is a quarter mile to our west. Now, I understand that not all homeless people are criminals and not all criminals are homeless. It is very important to differentiate that. But if you are desperate for food and shelter and feel like you have nothing to lose, you will do things to survive we definitely need to help these people, give them assistance to overcome their life struggles. Lack of shelter is part of the problem, but shelter by itself is not the solution. There are many reasons for homelessness, financial loss, affordable housing, mental health, drug use, and more. It is my understanding that with the city's new 2023 encampment policy, defining the exception or green zone behind Walmart that Nancy had mentioned is not in place anymore, I don't know, that the county would provide services for the homeless, for the safety and security of the residents of Nates and for their homeless, we implore you to provide the much needed services ASAP to address the causes, services provided in even temporary tents or trailers while the city proceeds with their next part of providing better facilities. Please do not wait for their completion. County services are needed now. After a mild winter, there are new fabric and wood encampment structures already being set up just south of Nate's behind Lowe's, clearly visible from the end of our Mary Street. The homeless need your help. Nate's needs your help. We both need some relief. Thank you so much for your time and all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last public privilege of the floor that I had listed. Is there anybody else? Last call. Next up is municipal officials privilege of the floor. I know we have Bob Lynch from the town of Enfield. Bob, come on up. Good evening. Robert Lynch, council person, town of Enfield. It's been a many weeks or months since I have updated you on Town of Enfield matters, a lot has happened. The unfortunate thing is every time your legislature meets, 
we have a Board of Fire Commissioners meet in Enfield, and I'm the town liaison to that. In fact, they will be meeting in about half an hour, so I will have to cut out after I give you my report. But I wanted to let you know some of the things that have gone on in Enfield, and a lot has gone on. I condensed it down to seven points, and I'm going to try to be brief with them. First of all, Enfield Fire District. Biggest thing that's happened in the past year in Enfield is that we transitioned our fire service from town board governed to governed by an independent board of fire commissioners. And you might know, and if you don't, you should, that your former member, Greg Stevenson, who used to represent District 8 on the county legislature, is now the chair of our Board of Fire Commissioners since the first of the year. He was elected in a special election last December when all the fire commissioners were elected uh, to replace the appointed board that we had previously as a town board appointed. Three new members joined the Board of Fire Commissioners at that time. The biggest thing that they have to do right now is to try to figure out how to transition the apparatus from ownership by the Enfield Volunteer Fire Company to the Enfield Fire District. And that's going to be an important decision they're going to probably be making uh, this evening. Uh, the biggest thing is the $825,000 pumper engine that was bought last year. It uh, was approved at bonding. Bonding was approved by the voters last October. Uh, it was originally thought it would be 20-year bonding, but they've decided, the new board has determined that a shorter period would be more advantageous to the taxpayers. So they may decide for a seven-year bond or a 10-year bond, and there's other apparatus that has to be transferred as well. So that's the biggest thing that's happened in Enfield right now. The second thing is something that affects you and us, and that is the Consolidated Local Street and Highway Improvement Program, better known as CHIPS. CHIPS provides a lot of money to Enfield to support our highway reconstruction. It supplies a lot to Tompkins County as well. And last Wednesday, March 13th, the Enfield Town Board adopted a resolution requesting Governor Hochul restore her reported $60 million reduction statewide in the funding of CHIPS. Last year, CHIPS provided $153,000 to Enfield. That, combined with three other state programs, provided $244,000 to Enfield for highway reconstruction and uh, repairs. And that constituted 56% of our highway reconstruction budget. So it's very important. I know that former Tompkins County State Senators, Tom O'Meara, Peter Oberrocker, and Pamela Helming have each warned of this impending cutback in CHIPS funding. And they have urged that the governor restore it in her executive budget. And that was the purpose of our town board action last week, to try to encourage um, Governor Hochul to restore that. And if you wanted to join as a legislature and encourage the same thing, we would appreciate it. I know that Senator Leah Webb, in her latest report from the Senate One House budget, said that uh, at least the state Senate was amenable to raising CHIPS funding to $698 million, which would be enough to erase the uh, reported hokal cuts and add a little more to the base funding. So, so it's an important thing that we stood our ground on last week. Number three, flood maps. Enfield was the only town in Tompkins County, uh, and they reportedly only one of, uh, only one of nine in New York State, uh, that uh, was not a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, the NFIP. Well, now we must be, because the new flood maps have identified Enfield Creek as an area where there might be a 100-year flood, and 20 homes are in that. And as you may know, that if you have a federally-backed mortgage, you have to uh, buy flood insurance if you are in a flood zone. And so not only that, but Enfield will also have to enact development regulations that will manage the construction in a flood zone. So we've assigned that to our planning board to come up with those regulations. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an imprecise a way of calculating where a flood is going to be. We know that there was a flood in, in what's known as the schoolhouse dip that you may remember back in 2013 got washed out. A culvert got washed out. That's not on the flood map, and I don't know why. Number four, land use development issues are affecting Enfield. The town board currently is reviewing a revised subdivision 
regulation package that was passed up by the Town Planning Board last September. Meanwhile, the Planning Board is reviewing our site plan review law. There may be changes there that we're going to be considering, and we may also update the comprehensive plan in Enfield. Number five, Applegate Corners. And here, a shout out to Jeff Smith, who helped us along. As you may know, the intersection of Route 79 and Applegate Road is a very dangerous one. Way back decades ago, there was a fatality there. There were two serious accidents there um, last year. Our fire chief, who is now the chair of the Board of Fire Commissioner, Greg Stevenson, warned of the danger. And so we requested the state look into that and uh, maybe make some improvements there. And uh, your highway director helped us out, forwarded down to the state. The state responded in late February. Scott Bates, regional traffic engineer for the state DOT, informed us they'll be making some signage improvements at the intersection. We kind of want a blinker there, but they haven't granted that yet, but maybe in the future. Number six, Bostrick Road Creek. On February 16th, John Nagley, district manager of the Tompkins County Soil and Water Conservation District, informed us we'd secured $693,000 in water quality improvement grant funds to replace a culvert carrying Enfield Creek under Bostrick Road. This is not just a minor thing. This is major because the creek is washing out the side of Bostrick Road. And this is a big project, $867,000 overall. And we thank the Soil and Water Conservation District personnel for forwarding this along. We thank also uh, Deputy Supervisor Greg Hutnick who wrote the application. We we'll hope to be doing that either this year or next, and that looks good. And finally, number seven, the town clerk's office. We spent some ARPA money, and we're going to renovate the town clerk's office. Mary Cornell is going to have some modernized offices there. She has to close down her office for four weeks, beginning in April. She's going to relocate over to the town uh, portion of the town board's meeting room in the Enfield Town Courthouse. So uh, that's going to be there, so people in Enfield should know that they'll, for about four weeks, have to go to a different office to buy their dog license or pay their taxes. And that's the update from Enfield. Thank you. Questions or comments for Robert Lynch? Rich. Yes. Um, one of my earliest cases when I started practicing law in Ithaca was a car accident at the corner of Applegate and Mecklenburg Road. So I'm happy to hear that there's some steps being taken to really look at improving safety there. It's a hazardous intersection, it's dangerous. They're going to put up some warning signs, speed limit reductions in that area, stop ahead signs. It's kind of dangerous coming out of Applegate Road, either northbound or southbound. You don't realize the stop sign's coming. And there were a couple of bad accidents there last year, and fortunately nobody was killed in those accidents. But it's, it's a hazardous place, and we're glad it's getting attention by the state. And I'm glad Jeff Smith is involved. So Thank you. Thanks for bringing it up. Thank you. Ann. Thanks for the thorough report, Bob. You, um, you also passed a resolution at your last meeting regarding the rapid response. Yes, we did. And um, I know that that's going to come up for some discussion in the future. It's going to come up for a discussion, I think, in April, early, maybe April 11th, when we next meet for a multi-municipal discussion of, of the, uh, um, the memo of understanding that we may draft. Um, mayor Rorden Hart, the mayor of Trumansburg, has been very passionate. He thinks, as do you, uh, legislator Corman, that uh, this should be a county responsibility. And he proposed a, he wrote a letter to our town supervisor uh, saying that, uh, will you please support full county funding for the rapid medical response system? And we passed a resolution unanimously last Wednesday that endorsed Mayor Hart's position. It doesn't mean we close the door to other alternatives. As I said at that um, February 29th meeting that we had with uh, Administrator Holmes and other municipal leaders. You know, the idea of the local municipalities paying a third of the cost, it's a starting point. But um, I, the town board seemed to be amenable, and I'm amenable, to considering full county funding. And again, it's a point of negotiation. 
Thank you, and it's glad to hear that you're still open to you know any ideas that come up. So right. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much for coming to report to us. I thank you for your time, and now off to the Board of Fire Commissioners. Thank you. Right. Next up is legislator privilege of the floor, Shauna Black. Yeah, I just have a, a few a few comments. Um, I want to make sure that the the individuals who came here tonight to speak in regards to the environmental health concerns know that. Um, Tompkins County would like to hear from you if there are pictures, if there are incidents, locations um, that could be identified. We do have a website that is taking, um, taking the information and that is tceh at tompkins-co.org. Um, you can also call on the phone number which is 607-274-6688. Um, I want to make sure that, that you know, while it is important to come here and we're going to pass your comments on to environmental health, it's equally important that if there are pictures out there, if there are specifics about where syringes are or furniture or used bikes, that, that people are in fact writing um, to our, envir our environmental health department and that they know about the, the specific situations. Um, also, I, I have two other um, comments. Um, I want to thank JR for bringing the proclamations forward. I had the opportunity over the weekend to read a really great book and wanted to share it with my colleagues. It's called The Women, and right now it is a New York Times bestseller, and it's about um, the women that were actually at Vietnam um, that were serving um, in the, the medical field, and they were serving as, as nurses. And unfortunately, what happened during that time is whenever they went back to their families, they were very much so ostracized and not seen as true veterans. Um, and it, it was really eye-opening to me because, of course, whenever you think of Vietnam, you always hear about the, the brave men that went out to war. And these women came back and they didn't have a place amongst their community and they really didn't have a place amongst the veterans. So it, it really dialogues um, the life of the women that went over and I would highly, highly recommend that book. Um, on another note, I would just like to note my, um, how disappointed I am at Cornell University for inviting Ann Coulter to be one of their speakers coming up um, April 19th. Um, I have found that Ann Coulter's rhetoric of homophobia and racist comments to be really intolerable. And unfortunately, it's a shame that Cornell University, who has really tried to pride themselves with being a university of acceptance, um, equity, and really opening the doors for diversity, would invite a person um, that believes the opposite. So it is very disappointing. Rick Mezzi. Uh, thanks, Dan. I uh, want to make sure the folks that came out from Nate's floral estate um, who spoke today make sure that they uh, know that they are heard. And um, I'm going to say something next. Um, and I think it's something that we really should take a hard look at because I don't know what changes when the weather changes because people are still homeless, right? Granted, it's warmer outside, but people are still living unhoused. So we obviously don't have enough shelter beds. We obviously don't have enough places for folks to go. Um, but we seem to make something work during the colder months. And I know that several things are being explored, several solutions are being looked at, uh, but those things take time. So I'm wondering if we take the model that we have existing in place with Code Blue and we just fund that through the rest of the year out of county funds. And we contract with the providers that are providing space for us currently. And we work as a, that as a solution because I don't see why what's gonna change now or in a year or two years, if we have more shelter beds, why not start solving the problem today rather than waiting for some ideal solution that will take a lot of time to get through committee. Um, and through public opinion and through collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think we have a responsibility to do something. I think if we have shelter beds uh, or a place to stay, we could take a harder look at, and this may be an unpopular term, enforcement around uh, use of city-owned land. Um, 
or, or other lands where folks are camping. Um, but I, I really would like to hear what other legislators think and if it's something we could take up in committee. Um, it's not like we're short on funds. Um, I know we have other priorities, but I think that there's a strong need and we can sit around and keep saying, hey, let's wait for a better solution or we can take an imperfect problem and have an imperfect solution and at least be doing something to create a safer, better community, not just those residents that are living here, um, also, but primarily for those that are unhoused, right? Because those are the folks that need uh, those services and attentions the most. Um, and I do hear that you should feel safe in your community and we should be doing a better job. Um, and it's hearing those comments repeatedly that eventually they do sink in. So thank you for saying those things. Uh, but I, I think that we're gonna have to fund it at some point. We might as well have the conversation now. I mean, I don't mean like right this minute, but you know, I'm happy <laughs> to pick it up in HED or HHS or you know, at the next committee meeting. But I do think we should really explore continuation of, of Code Blue through every 12 months until we have a better option available uh, for our unhoused community. Thanks. I'm going to jump in for a second. Of course, legislators are free to say what they want. I would hope that it would, it would be put into a committee meeting, that we don't discuss it right now, that it's on the agenda, people know that, that that's what we're going to spend that time doing, and that staff has the chance to prepare the necessary information to make it a meaningful conversation. Randy. Yes, thank you, Ken. Uh, I generally agree with you, Greg, um, and, but I also think it's, uh, there's an environmental problem there that's existed for a long time with all the um, garbage and trash and, and mess that uh, we should be moving on quicker, in my mind. Um, but anyways, I'm going to talk to you about um, the Thompson County Agricultural Environment and Protection Board's uh, Thompson County Ag Summit held yesterday uh, at the Enfield Community Center. Uh, it was uh, uh, sponsored by the uh, uh, Environment Protection Board um, and um, created and, and managed by CCE, uh, and those are funds that we provide to Cornell Crop Center for this purpose. Uh, but it was a very good, well-attended uh, meeting. Uh, we had mass capacity. Uh, there were uh, people from um, New York State, from the um, uh, from our own uh, Soil and Water Board, um, focused on many different things. Uh, people from the uh, USAID Farm Service Agency, uh, district conservationists, and they were focused primarily on climate smart um, agriculture and, and farm forestry mitigation, which primarily is focused on water runoff and contamination from, from various things on farming. One of the interesting that uh, they came and studied but of the greenhouse gases that are created uh, in, in the United States, 11% comes from agriculture, and that number's been steadily reducing. So I just wanted to share that. Um, the, uh, but there was a lot of information provided to a lot of farmers. I'd say about 40 farmers altogether were there. So it was a good turnout, uh, both farmers who've been there for generations and some new farmers and uh, two farmers of color as well who were on a, um, uh, they participated in, and ran a, uh, a panel after the event. Uh, but part of that was uh, talking about all the runoff and that there's extra money coming downstream. Um, and all that goes through our soil and water board. And they manage and they help people write grants. Um, and uh, that went, I think that was be helpful to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of things they talked about were related to the um, resiliency of climate. Uh, we have seems like drier periods, we have really strong rainy seasons, um, and how to manage that water runoff and even to create ponds so that when it rains a lot, you collect the water, um, and when there's drought, you can use the water in the ponds to, to manage, your, um, manage your farms. Uh, the other part was, uh, um, most interesting is there is a um, program for helping people to start farming for chestnuts and, and hazelnuts, a lot going on with that, it was very interesting. Uh, a lot of um, uh, discussion on native, native uh, uh, trees, uh, a lot of New York State money coming downstream for that. Uh, but the most interesting thing was um, a farmland protection program and uh, that's going to be coming uh, into um, 
Tompkins County, there's not one now. There's a, we have the Finglish Land Trust, but this particular trust is focused on protecting farmland only and uh, corn crop extension and our own planning and um, sustainability department have been working with an entity that's gonna be helping. They did a presentation. I think there's a lot of opportunity, so I just wanted to share that report. Thank you. Mike Lane. Today is village election day. Uh, for all but one of our villages. Uh, Lansing votes next month. Uh, polls are open uh, until 9 p.m. Uh, there are contested elections. I think there's a mayoral contested election in Cuba Heights. Uh, some of the other villages don't have uh, uh, contested elections, but you can still vote and show your support of those who are on the ballot or write in somebody else if you're not happy. Uh, our villages are important governments often overlooked. Having been a mayor myself years and years ago, uh, I know how much good they do uh, from everything from uh, uh, zoning in their villages to uh, uh, police protection, many of them. So I hope that folks in, uh, in Groton, in Freeville, in Cuga Heights, in Trumansburg, in Dryden uh, will go to the polls this afternoon and this evening. The other thing I wanted to mention, uh, just uh, something that I was reading about today, and that is the uh, decline in the number of young people we have in New York State. Um, this article happened to, be about, happened to be about New York City, where the number of kids in school had been reduced from, I think they said 100 and, or a million 100,000, don't hold me to the figure, but now it was, the, the number down there is under 900,000. And uh, they talked about in this article, uh, particularly a, a couple of schools down there uh, that uh, are near each other and they, there's a building which they both use. Uh, one of these schools uh, has seen the decline in, in, in numbers. The other one has had 120 new students added to it because of the influx of migrants. And these are young people that, that need to be educated. I think it says something for us in New York State that we need the influx, as we have historically, of folks to come in here to replace the outmigration of people that we see so often from New York State. Uh, we have jobs available, and we need people to be able to work here, and we need to be able to educate their children. And I just thought that uh, that came to mind when I read that, and I, I think it's so important. Uh, I'll be talking in a, in a few minutes about TC3 that saw a decline in, in students over since pandemic. Uh, that has to do with a decline in the numbers of high school students out there, uh, which is, has gone down. So I just wanted to say that this afternoon. Thank you. Anne. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank the folks that came out uh, in person and online to speak in, in support of the resolution regarding the state uh, uh, re resolution or bills uh, regarding climate change. And I'm just wondering is, I know we've already uh, talked about possibly reordering it at business as far as on the agenda. Is that something that we could possibly move up to let folks go? Yes, can you tell me which ones it's you're looking L. at? It's L. Mr. Uh, L. Are there any objections to moving L, resolution L up? Okay. Thank you very much. Your sure thing. Any other legislator privilege of the floor? Rich. Dan, I, I think you're absolutely right that we don't want to get into any kind of debate tonight, but I did want to register my support for looking at some sort of creative solutions. Uh, we might be really shocked at the price tag, but finding out what it is and thinking outside the box. We've been, I feel, sitting on our hands for a very long time and in a stalemate with the city, um, some creative thinking I think is called for. So that would be great if housing and economic development would pick it up and think about it. Thanks. Lee. I appreciate that uh, you wish to move that to the uh, committee level. And, uh, but I, I will echo that. If you're looking for a sense of the legislature, if the ending of code blue is going to exacerbate 
an already serious problem in that neighborhood, I'm all for taking a look at creative solutions and seeing them go to the housing committee. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. For the chair's report, I would like to talk a little bit about some things we learned today, meeting with assembly member Anna Kellis, who represents our district. Uh, Shauna, Lisa Holmes, and I met with her this morning. It was a half hour, it was tight, but um, we covered a lot of ground. It was, I think it was a productive meeting. We were, most, we were focused on budget issues, since this is budget time, New York State budget issues. Uh, we asked about the foreclosure process. This is when county government forecloses on people's land and houses who haven't paid taxes. And um, there is a proposal in the governor's budget that our New York State Association of Counties has spent a lot of time looking at and talking with her office about, and they, they want to see that version go through. The New York State Assembly has um, rejected that version, so I, we asked about that, and I learned something, which is uh, what Anna said is that the New York State Assembly automatically rejects any governor's proposal in the budget that they consider a not a budget item. In other words, an attempt to put something else into the budget uh, that should be talked about outside of the budget. I did not know that. So that's why the assembly has rejected that, that version. And, um, but, and Anna didn't have a lot to say about how this might affect the county and, and what version she's favoring and all that kind of thing. So there is going to be an increased cost to the county. We just don't know what it is yet. I was asked to ask about the emergency medical services bills that are in the New York State Legislature. There's a whole package of them that we understood from the Association of Counties Conference, has a lot of support and is likely to go through, but it's not currently in the budget. And what Assemblymember Kellis said is that that is still part of the negotiations, that there are people pushing to get that into the budget. So to, they're not dead and we should stand by on that. Uh, she was asked about the governor's proposal to cut some funding to nursing homes and other senior programs, and we were told that the assembly version puts that funding back into to the budget. So that's undecided, but that's, that's what the assembly is trying to do. Uh, we asked about the FMAP money. This is federal money that's meant to come through the state. <laughs> to the counties for Medicaid, and we last year it got taken away by the state. And I learned something else from our assembly member, which is that the governor's position is this, that the, the, the state's gonna keep that FMAP money kind of to balance out the Medicaid cap that the state has given to the counties. In other words, the amount that we or any other county pays for Medicaid is, is capped, the state take care of the rest, and they're keeping this FMAP money to offset that in their mind. That's what was reported to us. And then the last thing we asked about was youth mental health issues. And um, our assembly member wasn't quite prepared to rattle off a list, but she says there is a lot. She mentioned something that's being proposed called the TEACH program, but I don't know what that is yet. Uh, she's mentioned something about peer-to-peer -peer youth programs. And she mentioned $3 million extra that's being put into youth mental health facility beds, which is something that's in short supply. So I just want to report all the information that we got from our assembly member. All right, I'm going to keep moving on. Oh, I'm not going to keep moving on. Um, chair, I have one chair's appointment to the Workforce Development Board, Jian Wu, business member. Thank you. All right. Next up is special topic presentation discussion. This is an agency update. Tonight we're going to hear a little bit about Tompkins Cortland Community College from Mike Lane, our representative to that board. Thanks, Dan. Uh, when you asked me to do this, uh, TC3 is a pretty big topic uh, for two to three minutes. Uh, so I'm just going to hit a few highlights of what some of the things have been going on now. Uh, first of all, the college is probably the most important intermunicipal activity that uh, we do along with 
our partner, Cortland County, and the other partner is New York State. Uh, supposedly, uh, it's, fun it's funded uh, a third, a third, a third, the local shares, but the state has fallen behind, of course, and so have the counties. And too much is being uh, given to the students uh, through increases in tuition to have to pay. The counter argument to that is they, uh, many of them have uh, most of the tuition paid through uh, TAP and, and Pell Grants. Our college has a number of facilities. It has the main campus in Dryden, which is basically two buildings, the uh, academic building and the athletic facility. And now it's been joined by a daycare center the, uh, out there. It also operates an extension center in Cortland, an extension center here in Ithaca, the old uh, savings bank building. There's a farm adjacent to the campus in Dryden, and it has the Cultivari uh, Education Center and uh, restaurant and event center down on uh, Cayuga Street. Separate from the college, and, and I should say these, the real estate is owned by the two counties. Uh, and, not, and not by the college. Uh, so we own the campus, for example. The, what we don't own is the land that the TC3 Foundation owns, which is where the dormitories are. And the dormitories, uh, the foundation is set up to uh, provide uh, funding for the college in many ways, scholarships, uh, it's uh, handled the, uh, the dormitory situation. There's room up there for 800 students. We only have about 300 there. So the, the money coming in to pay the bonds has been a, a real problem for the foundation. There's been some discussion about whether the Cortland Extension Center should be sold. And there's been some discussion about whether the Ithaca Convention or the, the Ithaca uh, Center, did I say that wrong? The, uh, the Cortland Extension Center should be sold, and the, and the Ithaca Extension Center uh, should be relooked at be, simply because it's under, underutilized for classes. Uh, they, it's, uh, the Ithaca building is leased out. So it's, it's not a, a, a pediment to uh, what they're, we're trying to do for the, the foundation, but should it, uh, if it, if the people aren't attending classes there, because so many are doing them online, um, does it make sense to continue to, to have that? So I think that'll be a discussion we'll be hearing in the next couple of years. The micro-credential programs that the college has started have been very, very popular. There's five of them that have been approved by the uh, state uh, in, the, in the health industry. These allow uh, students to come in uh, for, say, five or six weeks. Uh, they get uh, some credit that can be applied toward someday uh, a full degree if they want to. Uh, it's, you work with the businesses in the counties uh, or the uh, the other programs that, that need folks particularly trained in a particular way of doing things. It's, and that's been popular. Uh, it, 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 it helps meet the goal of trying to educate our population, and it's a good thing. A uh, $3 million grant was obtained, and they have modernized the labs at the college, and that was a big deal. Uh, I know, Randy, you were there when we, we toured some of that, and they're, they're actually using them now, I believe. And they had a, an event last, uh, last week. The Chamber of Commerces from Cortland and Ithaca uh, put on a, uh, what's called a business after hours at TC3 at the Forum. It was very, very well attended, and uh, the speakers talked so much about how the college is helping uh, business development in both counties. 
some of us uh, worked with the college over the last couple of years uh, trying to get a handle on uh, the deferred maintenance at the college. And there had been a start before pandemic in, in 2020 for the idea of a new master plan, capital plan for the college. Uh, that kind of got set aside uh, with all the trouble with pandemic. Uh, but that's going to get uh, resurrected again. The, uh, the college is going to hire a consultant to help uh, start looking at uh, what, uh, what priority different kinds of things need to be worked on and uh, what the departments up there need. The, labor, uh, the, uh, the college will be negotiating with its four labor unions this year. Uh, at the Faculty Association, the Professional Administrators Association, CSEA Blue, and the Adjunct Faculty uh, Unit. Uh, the Farm to Table program, which is the farm and, and cultivare, you know, raise, raise your vegetables and things and, and be able to serve them at the restaurant, the cultivare is, is continuing. Uh, Cultivari had a setback uh, with some staffing. It has hired a new executive chef, and that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Scott Reisenberger, who has a, a great reputation, and uh, we're looking forward to that getting back. That, that teaches young people, and it also provides a service to the community. We think with the uh, uh, Ithaca downtown uh, uh, convention center that that ought to fit in very nicely uh, with programs that they will have. As far as applications, uh, our uh, president, uh, Amy Kremenak, who's doing a great job in my opinion out there, uh, lets us know about where we are as far as trying to get back to where we, to the student numbers we used to have. Uh, as for the f fall applications for 2024, uh, they have over 1,300 right now, and that's 11% over where they were at this point last year. Uh, one half are from the sponsor counties, Tompkins and Cortland, or uh, from uh, contiguous counties, we call them the donut counties. Uh, and uh, there's 25% from downstate, and the other is from basically uh, across New York, other, other states, and even uh, international students. Uh, the biggest number of applications they're getting is for the nursing program. Uh, there's a big demand for nursing, and the nurses uh, can move from TC3 into uh, the four-year baccalaureate nursing degree, and it costs a lot to run the nursing program. We are getting some financial assistance from both Guthrie uh, and from Cuga Medical that's helping with that, including uh, trying to uh, sponsor some, some night classes. Commencement is going to be May 21st of this year, and we all are always invited. And uh, if you'd like to do that, you simply respond, and they'll have a uh, cap and gown for you to sit on the platform and it's a really nice feeling to watch those students who've worked so hard to get their degrees uh, walk across the stage so I would really like to see more of, of you uh, participating in that glad to answer any questions but that's what I've got Dan thank you very much Mike that it's real shows a real wide variety of the things that are so, issues that are associated with our Community College. Questions or comments from Mike? Rich. I was trying to remember, what is our percentage? You mentioned that it was supposed to be a third, a third, a third. I thought we had taken some steps to get closer to that. Well, they, actually, they didn't ask us to, go, to raise it last year. Uh, I think we're around, don't hold me to it, but I think it's around 28%. And I see, I went and looked at our budget. It, we're putting in $3.3 .3 million. So. Plus, plus we did some over targets. Yeah, 281,000. Yep. Yeah, and one time. And that's one way we've been able to do that. Uh, Cortland has 
a tougher time. It has a smaller tax base. Uh, it lost population. And uh, for it to raise the sponsor's share is hard uh, for it. And that's why I think uh, the college didn't ask for it to do that last year. And our doing some over targets has helped us be able to uh, give the college a little help in some particular areas it, need, it needs to uh, be better in. And I think it had to do with uh, part-time students. Other questions or comments for Mike? I'll mention a quick anecdote. Um, someone that's important to me recently applied to TC3 for the fall and they submitted, they submitted all their final paperwork, et cetera, and they heard back the next day and got accepted. I was like, one day acceptance, that is impressive. That is good customer service, so go Panthers. I'll pass that on. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Mike. We're gonna move on. Next up is report by County Administrator, Lisa Holmes. Good evening, thank you, Dan. Um, I just have a few quick updates from county administration. Um, one is good news, we recently received notification that the county received a 2024 congressionally directed spending final award of 1.5 million to fund the construction of a building at the airport, a combined joint use uh, airport rescue firefighting and snow removal equipment building. Um, we um, had um, deferred this on our capital plan, but now this funding combined with a state DOT Air 99 grant um, will allow the airport to complete this project sooner than anticipated, um, which is very good news and we'll yeah. plan to be discussing it further <clears throat> in April uh, at the Facilities and Infrastructure Committee. Um, as Mr. Lynch mentioned earlier in the meeting, we have a follow-up meeting planned on April 11th with municipal chief elected officials to continue discussions on options for cost sharing of the rapid medical response program. And, um, and also, <clears throat> in, uh, in other news, last week we began interviewing candidates for the budget director position in county administration, and we hope to wrap that process up this week. I think those are my updates. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions or comments for Lisa? All right. Thank you, Lisa, $1.5 million. Sounds good. Next up, Acting County Attorney Holly Mosier. All right. So I don't have as detailed of a report as I had last time uh, because I've been so busy to keep track of it all. Um, but I can try to give reports like that periodically uh, since it seemed to be so helpful. Um, but uh, we've had uh, kind of an influx of more JDs and PINs cases that seemed to slow down for a few weeks, which really helped uh, us be able to help more of the departments throughout the county. Um, but now, uh, for whatever reason, in the past week, uh, we've been receiving more of those family court cases that keep us busy as well. So, but other than that, uh, things are going fine. Greg. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Could you just clarify for anybody watching what JD and PINS cases are? Sure, uh, so JD stands for juvenile delinquency cases. Um, those are cases where um, anyone under the age of 18 who commits a crime uh, goes before the family court rather than a criminal court. Um, PINS stands for person in need of supervision, um, and that's not necessarily um, a child who commits a crime. It's, it's more um, a child who is ungovernable or um, having trouble at home, say running away, um, unfortunately uh, doing drugs, uh, which is probably one of the biggest problems that we're having right now. Anne. Um, my, my question was answered by my colleague, Greg Mezzi, regarding the acronyms that I'm obliged to ask it. Sorry about, about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, and I will just mention that the interviews for the county attorney position uh, we did some last week, we're doing some this week, and then um, maybe by the end of the month we will, we will be able to make an offer. That's kind of the rough timeline. Uh, Dan, yes. uh, 
everyone's going to get a chance to, to see candidates. Yes. Just want to make sure everybody knows that. It's not just the committee. I believe an email went out today to tell you to reserve that time. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Okay, next up is Director of Finance, Lori Scarrett. Thank you. A couple quick updates. Uh, the in-rem foreclosure process, we currently have 27 properties, 12 are residential, 15 are vacant commercial land. Also, I wanted to give you a heads up that um, with an eye on potential interest rates decreasing, I've been working with fiscal advisors. We're gonna be watching those rates very closely so that if an opportunity for bond refunding comes up, um, our bonds, some of our bonds are callable in September. So most likely this summer, we'll be putting forth a bond resolution to, to, in anticipation of that bond refunding so that we're ready to go in September if those interest rates get to a point where it's advantageous for us to take advantage of that. And the other item I have is a casino revenue fourth quarter. Are you, would you like me to go ahead into that? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Bennett, sorry. So um, the first graph shows quarterly um, casino revenue by year. This year uh, for 2023, you can see each of the four quarters was right around the $600,000 mark, um, which is the highest uh, amounts that we've received consistently in all the years since we've been getting casino revenue. This, this slide shows the casino revenue with the actual dollar amounts shown. Um, Year-to-date actual for 2023 is just over 2.4 million. Last year it was just under 2.4 million, so this year we have an increase of $37,930. We did budget this at 2.1 million for 23, and that is what has been budgeted for 24 as well. And this also shows the, the actual to budgeted amounts. You can see in 2022, we budgeted only 575,000 and far exceeded it in 2022. So we're certainly much closer now with, in 2023. And this graph just shows the two uh, casinos. We have Del Lago and Tiago Downs. Del Lago brings in just slightly more revenue than Tioga Downs, but they both for 2023 are showing a very stable flat curve and not a lot of uh, variances. And that's it, unless I, anyone has questions. Questions about the casino report or any of the finance report? Ann. I just want to say thank you for the detailed report. It's very helpful to have this. Welcome. Mike Lane. Uh, we've been talking about this foreclosure process that you mentioned and the uh, the changes under the court court actions that uh, we're going to have to be dealing with and we don't know what those changes are yet because of the bills in the uh, uh, state legislature and uh, the our uh, the interpretation of the court case that came out particularly whether there's gonna be retroactivity, uh, in other words, foreclosures that have taken place over the past years are gonna be subject to uh, people being able to sue the counties and get, get uh, refunds from that. And also, I think that the other question is how they, uh, uh, who's gonna pay the schools, the towns, and the villages? Is the county gonna be stuck with all that? Are we gonna be able to charge it back? how that's gonna work. So uh, I think it's real important that uh, you raise that issue about something we have to look at. And uh, it might be a might be a wild ride. So I guess I, what, that's more of a comment than a question. I do think we'll know, there's a good chance we'll know the rules by a month from now. 
Any other questions or comments, Finance Director? All right. Thank you, Lori. Are there any resolutions to be added to or withdrawn from the agenda? Anne. I'd like to withdraw uh, Resolution K. Resolution K is withdrawn. And we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Consent agenda are, is resolutions and appointments to be voted on as a group unless any member of the legislature requests that a resolution or appointment be instead included separately and individually as part of the business of standing or special committees. For advisory board appointments, we have from the Housing and Economic Development Committee to the Community Housing Development Fund, Greg Mezzi, delegate, and Travis Brooks, alternate. And to the Downtown Ithaca Alliance, we have Veronica Pillar, member, and Greg Mezzi, alternate. Resolution A, Budget Adjustment Tourism Program 2024, ID 12237. Resolution B, calling for the restoration of funding for the Tourism Matching Grants Program in the State Fiscal Year 2025 Budget, ID number 12269. Resolution C, supporting proposals to modernize state sales tax laws to include vacation rental industry and to ensure these changes are appropriately tailored for the needs of localities, ID 12268. From the Government Operations Committee, Resolution D, Budget Adjustment, Board of Elections, Reallocation of Grant Money from 2023 to 2024, ID number 12238. Resolution E, Budget Adjustment, County Administration, Budget Adjustment, Appropriation of Unspent 2023 Funds for Chief Equity Diversity Officer, ID 12250. Resolution F, Appointment to Temporary Hearings Panel, Hearing Panels, Board of Assessment Review, ID 12254. And from the planning... I'd like to remove that one. Uh, resolution G. Okay, Resolution G is pulled. That is the consent agenda. Uh, let's have a vote. Oh, sorry. So we move the agenda. Consent agenda. Veronica moves. Shauna seconds. Thank you. Now let's have a vote. Um, oh, there is no debate. Is it, you have a point of order? I'll wait. Okay. Deborah Dawson? Yes. Rich John? Yes. Ann Corman? Yes. Mike Lane? Yes. Greg Mezzi? Yes. Veronica Blair? Yes. Lee Shirtliff? Yes. Mike Sigler? Yes. Shauna Black? Yes. Travis Brooks? Yes. Randy Brown? Yes. Amanda Champion? Yes. Susan Curry? Yes. Dan Klein? Yes. 14 ayes. Consent agenda passes. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to standing committees, and why don't we just start with the Planning, Energy, and Environmental Quality Committee, because now you have an extra resolution, so you can take them in any order you want. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, why don't we start with uh, Resolution L, and that's uh, packet page 38. That's the resolution to support the New York State budget proposals and legislation to address uh, climate change. And thanks for the folks who uh, spoke about it. The only other thing I wanted to say is that uh, the CLCPA, the uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which was passed in 2019, and then also the Climate Action Council scoping plan in 2022. Uh, so those were huge advancements that the state made to advance uh, and address climate change. And these are bills that are pertinent to this year's session at the state level and also the budget. And uh, so I uh, would like to move that resolution. Greg seconds, discussion. Randy. Uh, yeah, this came before the um, Pete committee and uh, I, I completely support a few of these, uh, like the package reduction um, for the better, bigger, better bottle bill. I don't remember, I think it should be stronger, uh, but there's a few here I do not support. Um, and I discussed those uh, in that meeting and so I just wanted to uh, say I'll be voting no. Mike Lane. I'd really like to thank our speakers tonight, particularly the speaker who talked about the bigger, better bottle. 
a bill. Uh, this is something that has come back year after year and really needs to be done. Uh, you made me feel old when you told me it was 40 years ago that we mm. pushed, we, mm. I say we, the, uh, I was in municipal government uh, at the village at that time, uh, where we advocated for uh, the initial nickel deposit. And overnight when that was passed and, and it got started, uh, it eliminated the broken glass in our parks and, and things like that. Um, but the, but you're right. The nickel has has is not doesn't buy what it used to. <laughs> and and uh, the other thing that's happened for the returns uh, is that the uh, redemption centers have gone away. They can't afford to make it work anymore. Uh, they were given a little more uh, profit on each uh, in each return. Uh, I think seven and a half or eight and a half cents like that as opposed to a nickel, and they could, they used to be able to make some, some money on being a redemption center. You can't do it anymore. Uh, what really makes me feel terrible is the people who throw out the PET bottles, like your, your water bottles, into the, or put, put them in the recycling. And it hits our recycling center, and the, the nickel deposit on that never gets redeemed. It's, they're crushed up uh, and baled and sold for the PET plastic. And I just think that that is the wrong way to, uh, to handle our deposits. And, uh, and I, I, I know Dooley Kiefer and I both advocated for years about we ought to have a redemption center here or we ought to be able to um, uh, somehow recapture those, but the the contractor keeps saying no. They want they get better money for the PET than they do for the deposits, so they they, they don't want to do that. Uh, along, you know, this and the uh, improving, uh, 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 making manufacturers come up with different ways of packaging so that we don't have to deal with that uh, nonsense that we have with everything in a bubble pack, for example, that you cut your hands trying to open. Uh, those are just a few of the things. Things ought to be returned. So I really appreciate that, and, and I'm sorry if I went on too long here, but it's a, an area that I really feel very strongly about. Uh, Mike Sigler. I just uh, I want to reiterate uh, kind of what Randy said. I, I think there are some in here that have, have merit and should be explored, and that there are others I, um, I disagree with. So I'll be voting on it as well. I, I would recommend people um, it's an interesting week that this comes forward. It is Sarah week. Um, this is where about 8,000 delegates, uh, 1,400 speakers, they all get together from 85 countries. This is in Texas right now, and they, they talk about the transition off of um, fossil fuels and things like that. And actually, there's a lot of fossil fuel people at this as well, and not that they're against this. And um, it's just, I was reading this one person. Now, he obviously is the CEO of Saudi uh, Aramco, which is obviously a fossil fuel producer, but he was talking about this and um, how maybe we should be relooking at, at how we are dealing with this for the simple fact that, you know, we are, are now using more oil than we ever have before. This will be a record year of, of oil use. Um, the, the south, uh, the southern hemisphere is not even caught up to the northern hemisphere when it comes to economic development. And as they do, you're going to see more and more oil and natural gas come online. And um, his, his argument is basically, you know, how do we keep more carbon out of the atmosphere as opposed to just limiting natural gas and, and gasoline, which doesn't seem to be working at this point. So um, it was just an interesting article. It was at CNBC. And there'll be a lot of articles coming out of this conference. And uh, I just I recommend people look at them. And uh, beyond that, it always interests me too, Mike, that about 50%, apparently, that's, that's always been the number I heard, do not recycle um, those 5%. So the state keeps that money. And those bottles are just never redeemed. So I always found that to be an interesting statistic. Thanks. Lee? A couple of things. Uh, I think the premises that uh, the resolution are based on, I, I can't disagree with much of what's in there. And uh, Brian, as always, uh, your arguments are persuasive. Uh, in particular, I'm interested in the Superfund aspect. 
Better bottle bill. Mike, yeah, I can remember that 40 years ago. I was an intern here on the county, previous county board of representatives, and there was a heated discussion over the passing of the bottle bill. But it ended up with bipartisan support here and bipartisan support in Albany. And probably 40 years later, it can be pointed to as significant positive uh, public policy that was enacted in those decades. And uh, I think it's time for an expansion. We talked here last year uh, as uh, Barbara Ekstrom was leaving about uh, uh, the uh, uh, initiatives to reduce the waste stream and to address packaging. I think we all support that. But there's, there's a couple things that are problematic for me, and I'll call your attention to an article that was in the Ithaca Journal on March 4th that uh, talks about the Menlo Micros Lansing facility. And uh, I bring this up because it, it points to uh, the estimate that uh, it will create 120 projected positions at, at Menlo, $18 million in direct wages and $28 million in direct spending in Tompkins County over the next three years. Now here's the key thing that I read into this. The predicted economic growth is being fostered by local lawmakers and officials who must pave the way for amenities such as natural gas at the site and ready a workforce to man manufacturing equipment in positions ranging from entry level to those requiring years of experience. And my concern in, in uh, looking at some of these items is that uh, uh, we may be moving to uh, further restrict uh, the availability of gas, uh, natural gas, to uh, support uh, economic development efforts and, and those efforts that may very well uh, lend themselves toward affordable housing. So I, I point that out. And I think that, again, climate change is, is, uh, is an issue that, that we're all concerned with. But um, some of these uh, initiatives that we have supported as a legislature and have been supported at the Albany level, uh, maybe time for a little reset on that, because uh, on that or some of them in that uh, looking, for example, at electric bus mandates. Those are going to be problematic to our local governments. And, uh, and as far as uh, being able to support uh, those uh, um, fine goals uh, with the electric grid that we're working with today, not practical. And uh, there, there's school boards out there that are really having a difficult time. And our village of Grattan, which has its own electric uh, distribution system, can't support some of these uh, um, initiatives that have been brought forward in the name of climate change. So parts of this I can strongly support, and parts I'm, I'm a little nervous about. Thank you. Deborah. Thank you. Um, Lee, I don't think that there's anything our local governments can do about the unavailability of natural gas to that Menlo Micro facility because that um, it is being driven exclusively by a moratorium that um, NISAC championed and was approved by the Public Service Commission based on the fact that the pressure in the natural gas pipeline as it moves north through our county when it reaches the village of Lansing is not uh, sufficient to um, allow uh, NISAC to take on new natural gas customers. It's been a longstanding problem for us here in the village and in the town of Lansing, as I'm sure Mr. Sigler will uh, confirm. Thank you. Rich. I will support the resolution, um, but I take the comments from some of my colleagues. This is a buffet of legislative propo proposals. Um, like a buffet, some things you like more than others. And um, I, I look at them, uh, some of them I think I need to be further educated on, but certainly I recognize that the status quo is not working to get us to where we need to go. Um, and we do need to rethink how our energy systems are working. I, I agree completely with the idea that with natural gas in particular, we should probably be thinking about prioritizing its use where it's absolutely essential to a business or some job creation enterprise um, 
and I think we're doing that to some extent in moving away from home heating with natural gas and moving to electrification there. But overall, I support the work put into putting this resolution together and I'll vote yes. Thank you. Anne. Thank you. Um, so folks might have noticed in the resolution that on uh, line 13, that the cost of inaction of, of not uh, passing these bills is, and other uh, actions that, uh, that would help the state to enact the climate plan are estimated to be 115 billion. And, and that doesn't include, uh, I'm sorry, it does include some um, health issues that, that people have. So I don't want folks to forget about that. It used to be that we talked a lot about health issues related to the use of fossil fuels. And now that we're looking at solutions, we're often talking about the, the costs of it. But so I want to remind folks that there are a lot of uh, health costs to this too. And the, uh, it was brought up about fossil fuels, uh, or at least for gas, for industrial purposes. And on all the talks that I've heard about and that I've been involved with, what, what, uh, what we're trying to do is reduce the residential use of natural gas and where possible, except for sometimes more moratorium or the actual availability of natural gas, is to make that um, available to industrial uh, users who there is no other, there is no other way to do it, at least not yet. So, um, so it's not about a natural gas 100% ban, it's about um, making sure it's still available while throttling back the residential use. Thank you. Mike Sigler. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify something on Menlo, but I, I wanted to touch on something um, you just said. I, I don't understand how you're predicting $115 billion worth of savings. I mean, it, I mean that number seems, I mean, that's kind of out of nowhere because if, if the world doesn't do this, if the world continues to use more and more fossil fuels, then how can you predict that there'll be $115 billion in savings? At the, I'll let you get to that, but that, does, that number seems very random to me. Um, as for Menlo Micro, I, I actually went and met with them, um, so I just want to clarify. They, they are not looking for more natural gas. They don't need any more natural gas. They're, they're set. They moved into a, a site, Kionix, um, which already had a, an ample supply for their immediate needs. And frankly, they, they don't predict that a lot of their things run on electricity. Um, if you want to see growth at an industrial park, though, of, of manufacturing, that's what more of the article was saying. If you want to attract other people, then you can go really one of two routes. Maybe you need a hook, right? You, need, you either need natural gas, or if the state wanted to, if, if the state, so far the state is committed to not building new natural gas pipelines uh, within the state, if it's going to remain committed to that, for a park like ours to stay competitive, and if we want to attract more uh, chip manufacturing, battery manufacturing, that kind of thing, then if we could get some kind of allotment for cheaper electricity from, say, Niagara Falls, like they do for other um, other companies in the state, then that would be great. That would be tremendous if the state saw um, saw fit to do that for us. So. But like I said, Menlo, um, just to clarify that, they are not, um, they're set. They are moving ahead with theirs. It's a very exciting product, actually. Um, they are not a semiconductor, actually. They are a full-fledged conductor and could really change the marketplace. I mean, we could be right at the forefront of a, of a new kind of technology that um, saves a lot of power, saves a lot of weight, saves, frankly, a lot of copper and materials that are used to keep uh, chips cool right now. Um, their their innovation may may really be a game changer in that in that marketplace. Thanks. Any more discussion about resolution L? And just quickly sure. to respond uh, to the 115 uh, billion estimate, that was uh, from the Climate Action Council uh, that w was appointed by the state to work on this over the last couple of years. So it's industry experts and scientists and professors, folks like that. Any further discussion? Okay, let's have a vote. Deborah Dawson? Yes. John? Yes. Ian Corman? Yes. Mike Lane? Yes. Greg Mezzi? Yes. Lee Shirtliff? No. Veronica Pillar, sorry. Yes. 
Mike Sigler? No. Shauna Black? Yes. Travis Brooks? Yes. Randy Brown? No. Amanda Champion? Yes. Susan Curry? Yes. Dan Klein? Yes. 11 ayes, 3 noes, resolution passes. Good. And you're still on. Yes, thank you. Uh, this was pulled from consent agenda, packet page 21. This is resolution G, accepting the Tompkins County Building Code Administration and Operations uh, Study. And my colleague, uh, Legislator Brown, wanted to say a, a couple of words or highlight some, some things in this study. Do you need a second or? Oh, I'll put that on the floor. Thank you. Randy, are you seconding it? Sure. Yeah. Very good. So I just wanted to bring attention to this. Uh, I thought this was good work um, by uh, um, the county and the planning and sustainability department uh, in cooperation with uh, the towns. And they came up with some good uh, uh, focus areas, um, uh, software and, and other types of things. And I thought it was a valuable study and I think it's, uh, it can help uh, various uh, municipalities. And uh, I just wanted to thank people for the work they did on it. I thought it was valuable. Any other questions or comments? I'll just mention that, you know, this has been years in discussion and I remember at the beginning, the most common reaction I had it to was, you want to standardize code enforcement across towns? That's not going to fly. And that's not in here at all. That's not what this is at all. So it's cool to see what else was in there and how that's been developed. Okay, are we ready for a vote then? Deborah Dawson? Yes. Rich John? Yes. Corman? Yes. Mike Lane? Yes. Greg Mezzi? Yes. Veronica Pillar? Yes. Lee Shirtliff? Yes. Mike Sigler? Yes. Shauna Black? Yes. Travis Brooks? Yes. Randy Brown? <coughs> yes. Amanda Champion? Yes. Susan Curry? Yes. Dan Klein? Yes. <coughs> 14 ayes. Resolution passes. And uh, I just wanted to explain a little bit on Resolution K uh, for the Soil and Water uh, Conservation District. Do you, do you want to move it first? Then? No, uh, that, I just wanted to explain oh, why came. that was pulled. Sorry. sorry. Um, so so uh, to pr provide uh, interim financial assistance to the Soil and Water um, Conservation District. Why that why it was pulled? Because that's uh, needed to go through budget also while it was passed at peak, so it hasn't gone through budget yet. So uh, that's why it was pulled from tonight's uh, legislature uh, agenda. And uh, one other uh, major thing I wanted to talk about was we discussed the local solid waste management plan and we talked about the input from the community and the responses from the Recycling and Materials Management Department. So that you uh, will recall that this was a draft was sent to the state uh, a while back. And so now this input from the community is being, in, and the responses from our, our uh, Recycling and Materials Management Department, those responses are being integrated into the draft plan and being sent back to New York State. So it's still in process and I want to thank our, our departments for working on that. And the next meeting, we changed the time for our April meeting due to the um, important solar eclipse that is happening. So we are going to meet not on a Monday, but we're going to meet on a Thursday, which is April 11th at 1 p.m., which is a different time to was there uh, anything else that I missed or anybody wanted to say? I guess that's it for now. Any questions or comments for Ann? Great, thank you, Ann. Deborah has a hand up. Oh, that's all right. Go ahead, Deborah. Thank you. I'm a little confused because at BCP, that resolution was pulled, and we were told that it needed some work. So. Right. I don't know why it's been held up, but it, it was not because BCP didn't have the opportunity to look at it. Well, I, I didn't mean that it, you didn't have the opportunity. It didn't go through BCP. I, I don't, so. I was pulled. So it needs some more work, as you said, I guess. Okay, thank you. Just clarifying. Veronica. What I was told was just that what was laid out in the resolution wasn't the best way to account for supporting the Soil and Water Conservation District with their cash flow, and the county still intends to do that, but 
in a different way and that wasn't ready for the two committees and legislature pathway on time, on time for this meeting. Thank you, Brad. And I see Lisa Holmes shaking, nodding her head, yes. Thumbs up, and a thumbs, thumbs up. up. All right, we're gonna go back to the top of the batting order. First inning, next up, Donna Black, Health and Human Services Committee. Thank you, Dan. Our next meeting is Wednesday, March 20th, which is tomorrow at 1 p.m. We will be joined by our Human Services Coalition and they're going to do a quick presentation on the process um, coming up in order to submit requests to be part of the Tompkins County budget. They're also gonna walk us through the vetting process. We're gonna be joined by Frank Kruba, who's gonna talk about some of our um, opioid overdoses. We'll also get an update on environmental health and what they're doing as far as some, some cleanup efforts. And um, we do have a few resolutions. So be there or be square. Questions or comments for Shauna? Thank you, Shauna. Housing and Economic Development Committee, Greg Mezzi, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dan. I'll give a quick uh, report and then we'll go into the resolution. Uh, we last met on Wednesday, March the 6th. Um, we had a full agenda with uh, several resolutions you saw on the consent agenda. Um, we had an um, update from Ithaca Area Economic Development. Um, the most interesting piece of that meeting though I thought was the continuum of care update as they talked about their uh, Asteri housing surge uh, and that was a really great um, portion of the meeting it was towards the front so if you want to go back and get more details um, but essentially the housing surge they were they were using this as an opportunity to try to uh, get a by name list of folks uh, ready and prepared so that when the units at the Asteri uh, near the conference center were ready to go they could quickly move those residents um, mm -hmm. from whatever shelter or, or unhoused situation that they may be in uh, into that permanent supportive housing. Um, just some quick facts about the by name list that they shared. 100% of them have some sort of uh, identified disability. They range in age from 20 to 63. 53% of them are women, 47% are men, 75% at some point have experienced or, or, or survived domestic violence, and 25% um, are household more than one. Uh, it's really interesting to, to learn about that. I'm sure as things change with that list as it's kind of a moving target, those demographic information is, is maybe not accurate at this point in time, but when that update was given, it was. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting, but hopefully we hear more about that surge as it, it continues. I also thought one of the interesting things is we're sort of uh, on this wish list of things we'd like to see the state do tonight. Um, Heather McDaniel from Ithaca Area Economic Development talked about FAST New York program, which is uh, state funding for shovel-ready economic uh, development sites, um, grants that are available, and how we need a FAST New York type program for housing development so that um, counties, municipalities, other agencies can get together and find parcels, create infrastructure that's necessary, which all, often is the highest barrier and what makes projects uh, unable to be completed, um, and some funding. I know the governor has a strong commitment to trying to create uh, more housing throughout the state. Um, and so I think urging our elected officials in Albany to look at putting some funding aside for something like a fast New York uh, so that we can build more residential housing, we can create more infrastructure where needed uh, is really something that we should continue to press on and uh, hopefully we can, can work with Heather and, and others to try to advocate for that at the state level. Um, that also segues into resolution uh, H uh, which is urging New York State to reduce the cost of state mandated programs on local taxpayers to help alleviate the housing affordability crisis. That's doc ID 12267 and I'll go ahead and move that. Thank you, and seconds, discussion. Uh, this was a resolution that came out of uh, one of the committees at NISAC. Uh, there's a lot of information in the whereases, the several whereases that are uh, listed here about the cost and, and some of the major cost shifts that have happened over the years from the state budget uh, down to the, to the county and, and other local municipalities. 
So what this resolution is calling for, and if I may just read the last resolve, that the Tompkins County Legislature urges the state legislature and Governor Hochul at a minimum to freeze the growth and county costs for all state mandated programs and further to include significant new funding to reduce or eliminate the 14 billion in annual payments counties make for state mandated programs as part of the state fiscal year 2025 budget and beyond. Essentially, we have we have shifted so many costs from state mandated programs down to counties that uh, we're making it incredibly unaffordable to live in many parts of our state and we need to do something more creative in Albany and take some of those costs off of the, the local uh, tax burden um, so that one, we can provide services that are more unique to our community, but also alleviate the ongoing concern of uh, constantly increasing tax bills to our, uh, to our residents. Thanks, Sigler. I wanna thank Greg for uh, bringing this back from NYSAC. Um, I also wanna commend Michael Lane, who's I think literally advocated for this for the last 20 years, uh, at least as long as I've served with you, you have. Um, I, it's you know, preaching to the, to the choir, you know. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, I mean, we, we are one of the, I think, I don't even know if we're one of two states anymore. We may be the only state um, that still requires counties to pay for Medicaid. Um, certainly something that should change, and um, I hope that one of these years it will change. But uh, as of right now, it is not. So thank you, Greg, again, for, for bringing this forward from NYSEC. Any other discussion? Let's have a vote. Deborah Dawson. Yes. Rich John. Yes. Ian Corman. Yes. Mike Lane. Yes. Greg Mezzi. Yes. Veronica Pillar. Yes. Lee Shirtliff. Yes. Mike Sigler. Yes. Shauna Black. Yes. Travis Brooks. Yes. Randy Brown. Yes. Amanda Champion. Yes. Susan Curry. Yes. Dan Klein. Yes. 14 ayes. Resolution passes. Anything else from or for the Housing and Economic Development Committee? Uh, yeah, our next uh, committee meeting is gonna be April 3rd, Wednesday at 3 p.m. I have a feeling it'll be an interesting one, so <laughs> come on by. Rich. I believe we're approaching the opening of the uh, conference center, and it would be great to get a report on where that is at and, uh, and what comes next. Uh, yeah, if, if I can, I had a quick tour with uh, some folks from the STPB maybe a week ago, um, and it, it is looking very near completion um, on the inside. It's, a, it's an incredibly beautiful space. It was really well done uh, and designed uh, re really nicely, and I'm happy to get more of a comprehensive uh, update, but it is something that there are many people staying up to date on. So. Uh, as soon as I can get you more information, I will. I'm just not prepared this evening. Um, but the, the tour was great. And if anybody has a chance to take a tour at, at some point, um, I highly recommend it. Anything else for Greg? Okay. It is 7.30. Shall we power through to the end of the standing and special committees or take a break? Five minutes. Hmm? Five minutes. Okay. We are going to take a little, let's call it a six minute break. Six and three quarters. Email about the teacher.
is the, well, yes, next up is the Facilities and Infrastructure Committee, Lee Shirtliff, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, facilities and Infrastructure has not met since uh, last meeting. Um, there were zero items forwarded for the agenda for this month and a question of whether we would have a quorum. Therefore, we're canceling the meeting for this Thursday and we'll meet in April. Okay. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Government Operations Committee, Amanda Champion Chair. Thank you. Um, we met on March 7th. Um, and we had quite a packed meeting. Um, numerous of the resolutions are here um, on the consent agenda, and we've got a couple here. Um, but a couple other things that we talked about, Jay Franklin was there from assessment. As we all know, this is a big topic at the moment. We had a good conversation with him. I think the committee could talk about assessment for the full two hours. So, um, had to had to curtail that a little bit, but um, Jay gave us some some good information. We talked about the preliminary tax roll, and um, if you're interested, you can certainly watch the um, the video tape, as they call it. Um, we discussed the history center a little bit. Ben Sandberg was here. Um, kind of the main topic was um, if if and how the legislature or the county can, we can get some historical artifacts from the History Center and get them into more of our county buildings where people can actually see them. Um, so that was interesting. The History Center board is working on a policy for how they loan things out. And um, we also kind of need to talk about a policy for ourselves. But that's interesting. It'd be great to get some, you know, maps and pictures and artwork that um, we could display. Um, Bridget Nugent gave a good update on our grants consultant, um, which was in the budget a year ago, a long time ago. Um, but she gave us like a full rundown of what's going on there. And um, again, I'm not gonna summarize, but definitely go back and, and listen to all the things she had to say. It was, it was a good presentation. And then we had a, a long discussion about our goals. Um, well, no, we didn't have a long discussion about it. We have a long list <laughs> of goals, which people still keep adding to. So we have a lot going on at GEO this year. Um, and then I can move on to the resolutions, unless there are questions. All right, um, resolution I, approval of the 2024 order of succession of members of the county legislature to serve in the absence of the chair and vice chair. And I would move that. Greg seconds, discussion. I guess I would just say um, we talked about this. As you all know, this was something that came up uh, at the beginning of the calendar year. It's something we do every year. There was some disagreement on what this should say when it came here to the legislature. So we talked about it again at committee. And um, Katrina provided us some really good information of literally the past 20 years of how this, not how this was decided, but, but who was on that list. And for at least all of the 2000s, um, there weren't names. It was chair of this committee, chair of this committee. Um, and in some cases they listed, you know, four or five. It wasn't just one, two, three. So um, we kind of thought that that was a good thing to go back to. Um, it kind of takes the personalization out of it. If a chair changes or a person leaves the legislature or is no longer the chair of that committee, it would still remain the chair, not the person. So we went back to that and we thought it was a, a good plan. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Other discussion? Deborah. Oh yes, Deborah. thank you. 
Yeah, I just wanted to note on line 14, it should be budget capital and personnel, not budget capital and finance. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, no. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay, let's have a vote. For Dawson? Yes. Rich John? Yes. Ian Corman? Yes. Mike Lane? Yes. Greg Mezzi? Yes. Veronica Pillar? Yes. Lee Shirtliff? Yes. Mike Sigler? Yes. Shauna Black? Yes. Travis Brooks? Yes. Randy Brown? Yes. Linda Champion? Yes. Susan Curry? Yes. Dan Klein? Yes. 14 ayes, resolution passes. Great, thank you. Um, and then the next resolution, uh, J amending resolution number 2017-160, adoption of revised sign-in form for public speaking at legislative meetings. I would move that. Mike Lane seconds. Um, and this is something that came up also earlier in the year. Um, you know, it's happened over the years that we have a lot of of guests, publics, um, folks in the audience, and when there's an emotional issue, um, people can tend to shout out or, you know, respond to something maybe a legislator is saying or someone else is saying, um, and we really want to discourage public the public from responding in that way. It's a time to have everyone be heard. Um, each person gets a, a chance to to speak. And so this was, this is guidance. This is something we're adding to the blue form. And this is something that if someone wants to speak, they are agreeing to. If someone is not speaking, we can't necessarily, um, you know, force them to agree to this. But this is guidance. This would also be guidance for um, the chair to say, you know, this is something that we were trying to um, preserve decorum in chambers. And, and I should just read what it says, what we're adding um, to the blue forms is, I agree to be courteous and not make comments, gestures, outbursts, or other disruptions while other members of the public or legislators are speaking. And that is just a, a courtesy thing that we hope people will follow. Andy. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me. One other, um, at one of our recent um, meetings um, after the vote, we had a recess, and uh, I was confronted by a few people on how I voted, and that's fine if that's the way the, the game is played, but, but should that be something in there as well? I mean, they were not happy individuals, um, and, and I get it, you know, that it's an emotional issue. Uh, I was surprised, frankly, how aggressive the people were. Um, but, you know, I've dealt with that before, but maybe somebody that's not me would have dealt with it differently. I just wanted to share that. So. Any other questions or comments? Rich. Yeah, I, I would just say that I, I support the resolution and the changes we're proposing to make. We certainly have had some very heated discussions here recently and um, hard topics, and we want people to come speak with us. Uh, I, it just, what is the purpose of coming to speak to us? If you want to be persuasive or informative or to challenge us, you know, if, if it's confrontational and really gets down to name calling, it doesn't do those things. It locks people in their corners. Um, so I, I, I favor this language and I hope it helps people understand why they come and talk to us. They're trying to change our minds often and it doesn't do it if you're just Yelling, yeah, so, thanks. Deborah. Oh, okay, <laughs> Yeah, I think another purpose of this is so that people who come and express diverse opinions, and opinions that aren't shared by perhaps the majority of other people in the chamber, don't feel intimidated and threatened. I think that's important. Any other discussion? <laughs> okay, let's have a vote, please. Deborah Dawson? Yes. It's John? Yes. Ann Corman? Yes. Mike Lane? Yes. Greg Mezzi? Yes. Veronica Pillar? Yes. Lee Shirtliff? Yes. Mike Sigler? Yes. Shauna Black? Yes. Travis Brooks? Yes. 
Randy Brown? Yes. Amanda Champion? Yes. Murray? Yes. Dan Klein? Yes. 14 ayes. Resolution passes. That's all I got. Any other questions or comments for Amanda? All right. Thank you. Next up is the Community Recovery Fund Advisory Committee. We are going to be meeting on this coming Monday, March 25th at 10.30. It's our first meeting in, I can't remember, maybe six months or something like that. Since last summer? December. December, okay. Oh, that's not so long ago. Um, we have a couple of projects that the, they've requested a change of scope of what they would like to use their money for, so we need to discuss that. A few other items that I would, I would kind of call housekeeping, but they're, they're necessary and actually should be kind of interesting. Uh, so that is coming up. Any questions or comments about that? All right, next up, Budget, Capital, and Finance Committee. Mike Lane, Chair. <laughs> Excuse me? Just making sure everyone was awake. <laughs> the Budget, Capital, and Personnel Committee met on February, not on February 8th. On March 14th, and much of what we did were, was is taken up in our resolutions. We did pass uh, a resolution to uh, reappoint uh, Roxanne Buck to the Tompkins Cortland Community College Board of Trustees, the longest serving member there. And uh, that passed unanimously, and that will be coming not to tonight's meeting, but to uh, uh, the April meeting. Uh, Lori uh, gave us the uh, rundown on the uh, casino money, and uh, some of us, me in particular, said it's nice when it's coming, but don't count on it. Things can change. Uh, new casinos can be built in Rochester or other places that could affect uh, the regularity of the funds that come in on that. We wanted to remind everybody that uh, our budget retreat, the annual budget retreat, is scheduled for April 30th at 5.30 p.m. and the location is now at the Health Department, the Rice Conference Center. April 30th, 5.30, Rice Conference Center. <clears throat> we talked quite a bit about uh, the direct report uh, reviews. Remember, we have four direct reports to the legislature. That's our uh, uh, legislative clerk, our county attorney, our director of finance, and our county administrator. And we always struggle a little bit on how to uh, evaluate them. And they're, they're entitled to have evaluations done because it's, it helps them know where they stand vis-a-vis -vis the legislature. Uh, we haven't done a full uh, program for, I think, since before pandemic. We've, we've made some efforts at it. And, but we've had a lot of uh, personnel changes, and that was one of the reasons that we were kind of uh, holding back on that. But we charged our Commissioner of Human Resources to uh, recommend a plan, and uh, she's been doing that. Uh, there's been a committee working with her. And uh, instead of basically having uh, one review committee, such as the personnel, budget and person, capital and personnel committee. Uh, the suggestion is being made that we divide up among the legislature and focus on a particular, each group focus on a particular direct report so that there are maybe three or maybe four members uh, watching and, and discussing with the county administrator, for example, and the same with the other three. The idea is that we can have better feedback on a regular basis. There would be uh, a beginning discussion, goals set, both by the uh, direct report person, uh, him or herself, and the, also by the legislature. The there would be a mid-year review and an end-of-the-year review to see how those things are happening, whether they've made progress. 
Uh, so I think that's basically what, what we want to move forward to. And we sort of need to have you folks decide who you might want to uh, be associated with, which of the, the four uh, of the direct reports. So why don't you uh, maybe send uh, an email to me and uh, copy uh, Ruby Pulliam so that we can get some ideas. And if they all want to pick one and uh, because they, they like that person, uh, we may have to move people to different locations. But that's sort of the way we're heading right now. Uh, there's been some work done to get ready for the 360 uh, review process. And uh, Ruby, is there anything that you'd like to add that I've missed? Hi, no, you've captured most of it. We have the committee will still be working on developing those objectives from the expectations that the legislators submitted and developing the questions for the 360 review. But if we have the legislators assigned to a specific direct report, there's no reason why we can't have all of the evaluations being done at the same time or the same year versus two this year and two the following year. So we're going to try it, and I think yes. uh, I think it, it's a, a, a way forward, and I, I have great expectations that it'll work. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention that uh, uh, Ruby told us that we now have 864 employees uh, for the county, but but that includes all the board of board of elections workers, plus all the uh, youth workers for the summer. Be glad to answer any questions. Questions for Mike Lane. Ann. For the uh, budget retreat, so are we meeting at the health department, the rice conference, there's a rice conference room, a rice conference room, not center, right? No, there's a rice conference room at the health department. At the health department, okay. All right, thank you. I said something wrong, I don't know. You said Rice Conference Center, and so I was trying to find where that was. Any other questions or comments for Mike? I, I've got one, Mike. I could use some, oh, sorry, Deborah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, Ruby gave us a very comprehensive report of all the work that her department has been doing over the past several months. Um, and it was kind of a mind-boggling <laughs> recitation. Uh, uh, the HR department has been really, really busy. Uh, I, I think it would be uh, helpful to everyone to just kind of tune in to that one particular segment of our BCP meeting. It was towards the end. Um, but anyway, it was, um, it's impressive. And hats off to Ruby and her department. Thank you. Mike, I could use some clarification on, uh, and Ruby. Um, so we're talking about forming these little teams that would be assigned to individual um, direct reports, but are we, is that in place of the review that's happening right now, the 360 review and happening through HR department, or how do those two things mesh together? I don't think they're, I think they both go along together uh, at the same time. We're trying to, have a process of what, what we want is for our direct reports to be able to have a sounding board all year round, not just uh, once a year when we uh, 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 do a, uh, a committee review. Uh, if something comes up, uh, the legislature isn't happy, we've got the group can, can tell the direct report. If the direct report feels that uh, uh, the, the direct report is not getting uh, help the way they need or need need something else or wants to alert us to something that may be coming up uh, They could do that and it's I don't anticipate it being a, a terribly hard lift uh, but uh, I think it, it would be useful to have this uh, 
the ability for us to uh, listen more to the direct reports. Thanks. And then Ruby, what 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 timeline might we expect on the the 360 evaluation this current round? The 360 evaluation is part of the entire process. The legislators will have their survey to respond to. At the same time, the legislators are responding to the survey. The 360 survey will go out. So it won't be, we're not doing the 360 before uh, the committees are formed, before there is a self-evaluation portion and the legislative portion. So you'll have the self-evaluation, the legislators evaluate, and a 360 going on simultaneously, pretty much. What's our expected timeline on finishing all that? Well, we're working with the questions now. My hope, and don't hold me to it, is that by July, we will be able to begin the performance program year. The beginning is an initial dialogue, going over the expectations, uh, solidifying the goals that we hope the direct report will achieve, and then establishing a timeline for the review. The 360, the legislators review, won't occur until the end of the program year. So we're not doing just one event, it's a program year that includes all of those components. Okay, thank you. Sense? Not exactly, but I think I'll talk to you some other time. <laughs> okay, I, I'm not sure and I, I can provide that. you with the components of that I've provided to the BCP committee so that you can understand the steps we're taking. That'd be great, I should tune in, yeah, tune into that process, thank you. Uh, Shauna. Yeah, uh, one more thing that we talked about in BCP um, was Ruby and Sarah Thomas came to us with their research on oh, yes. disability and life insurance and cancer, cancer care insurance, and I think there were a few others. And one, one thing, we, we were emailed the premiums for those, which all seemed pretty reasonable. Um, there's no physical that has to be done. If you're hired, you're eligible for this insurance. Um, and one of the things that we discussed in our committee as well was offering all of our employees um, the $50,000 of life insurance. And I believe it was only gonna cost the county, I think the numbers were $60,000 a year. So that is something that, what it sounded like was our, our committee was pretty fond of that idea um, to the point of might even considering doing that um, starting relatively soon. Yes, we didn't make any decision on no that. No decisions, yep. And uh, that sheet, did that go to all the legislators that we were given at the, because uh, that was me. an excellent sheet that Sarah brought us, and uh, thank you, Shauna, for reminding mm -hmm. me about that. But please, uh, if we could get that sent out to all legislators, that would be nice. It says she will take care of it. Thank you. Anything else for Budget, Capital, and Personnel Committee? Next up, Workforce Diversity and Inclusion Committee, Veronica Pillar Chair. Thank you. WDIC has not met since our last meeting, and our next meeting will be next Wednesday, March 27th at 3 o'clock. Questions or comments for Veronica? All right. Public Safety Committee, Rich John Chair. Thank you, Dan. Um, Let's see, Anne, I think you might have already said you moved your committee meeting, but uh, I think the date of the eclipse has been changed from the 8th to the 11th, you know. No way. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's just a partial eclipse on that day. <laughs> Maybe it was a partial change. Um, but I bring it up because from a public safety standpoint, I just want to say it, mm -hmm. do not look at the eclipse unless you are in the zone of totality. You can really damage your eyes and it happens every time there's an eclipse. People don't understand that. They think they can see it and you can, but it's burning your eyes. Um, anyway, there are glasses you can use. I don't know where you get them, but if you really want to see it and it, you're in a partial zone or it's going in or out, uh, wear the glasses or don't. NASA approved glasses. NASA approved glasses. Lowe's has them. Yeah. Um, 
I have a few other things. Um, the Public Safety Committee has not met since our last meeting. We will be meeting a week from today, uh, March 26th at one o'clock. Um, I wanted to give the jail numbers. We are at 51 with zero board outs. And over the month of March, those numbers have trended down. Um, we had been running in the 60s pretty steadily, and I think we even hit the 70s. So something is uh, going in the other direction, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there is an open house at the Department of Emergency Response tomorrow from 12.30 to 4 to uh, meet the new um, Rapid Medical Response Department personnel. Um, this is uh, like an eclipse, so once in a lifetime opportunity to meet something right at the beginning. We will never have the beginning of Rapid Medical Response again. So um, that's up on 92 Brown Road. That's for legislators, other municipal leaders, and staff. And then I have one resolution, which I'd like to uh, put on the floor. This is authorization to appropriate funding, implementation of memorandum of agreement between Tompkins County and Tompkins County Deputy Sheriff's Association, ID 12230, and I move it. Uh, Lee Shirtlift seconds. I would just um, offer that the purpose of this resolution is to adjust some salary lines to reflect market conditions. Mike Sigler. I just wanted to uh, say I'm going to recuse myself from this vote. That's about it. Or should I? I, I should I think, probably. I think the, for the rules, you do have to state your reason. Okay, so um, I've been endorsed in my Senate campaign by the Tompkins County Sheriff's Deputy. I'm very proud of that endorsement. And um, you know, I, I don't, you know, some people would say there's a conflict. I, I think I could vote my conscience regardless, but to satisfy um, anybody who may suspect that, I'll just clear the field and, uh, and recuse myself from the vote. Very good. Conflict. Any other discussion? Veronica. Um, oops, sorry. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to vote for this because <coughs> I guess I see there's already been a memor memorandum of agreement. Uh, sorry, I got braces yesterday. Talking's hard. Um, <laughs> you won't see them. Uh, um, I see there's already been an MOA entered into, so maybe this is like in some way a done deal. But I don't. Um, I don't really understand the rationale for raising these wages in response to what I think is a wage increase by just one other competing institution. Um, I like, I know that wages for similar jobs going up at a competing institution, like causes difficulty in, I guess, hiring and retention here, but that's not just true among deputy sheriff or police officers, the institutions here at IPD, so of course the title is not quite the same. Um, it's true among so many of our positions and I guess I don't know our vacancy rate now, but at least as of budget time last year, it was pretty high. So I can't imagine that other vital jobs we're doing don't also have hiring struggles, and so I question why we're putting money in this direction, especially when I scrolled through some of the, um, the compensation study results from last year. I know everything has changed since then. Um, wages have been increased. I look at a couple of the, uh, the, um, the, the market rate adjustment and or union contract increases for our blue collar and white collar employees, and the, the shifts there are they, they seem like reasonable overall. It's really hard to make sense of all the, the many numbers and it's comparing all sorts of fruits to other sorts of fruits, um, to mess up a metaphor. But the, the, all these titles seemed per the compensation study to be pretty fine of the, at the time of the compensation study at the rates they were getting paid. And I understand that the comparison has changed, but when I survey the numbers, it really looks like what we're looking at here in this resolution is something that 
we don't even consider with most of our like non-management positions. And I don't think I'm comfortable just voting for this almost as a matter of course. Rich. Uh, I, I will support the resolution, but just for clarity, this is, has, is not a done deal. That's the purpose of our vote is to implement. Thanks. Any other discussion? Can we have a vote, please? Deborah Dawson? Yes. Rich John? Yes. Ann Corman? Yes. Mike Lane? Yes. Greg Mezzi? Yes. Veronica Pillar? No. Lee Shirtliff? Yes. Mike Sigler's recused himself. Shauna Black? Yes. Travis Brooks? Yes. Randy Brown? Yes. Amanda Champion? Yes. Susan Curry? Yes. Dan Klein? Yes. 12 ayes, one no, and one recusal. Motion passes. Thank you. That's all I have. Any other, any questions or comments for Rich and the Public Safety Committee? Next up, Downtown Facility Special Committee, Randy Brown, Chair. Uh, yes, thank you. This is now the biggest committee and, and most interesting one. Um, <laughs> the, so we, uh, we had um, a meeting on the 12th. Uh, we went over the uh, timeline just for um, the uh, process of creating and approving uh, um, a design and the cost and whatnot. Uh, but it looks like if all things go well, that it's about four years away before this building would be um, people to move into it. So uh, many things have to happen from that, but I appreciate the timeline. And I think we'll clean it up a little bit, make it a little easier to read, um, um, but we'll, we'll focus on that. We did uh, um, also talk about um, the removal, we had a, a resolution for removal of properties located at 308 North Tiger Street. Uh, and uh, I have a resolution for that, but we also talked about uh, the RFP, and uh, there was discussion about that, uh, how important it is, um, and um, the, the committee didn't really have sufficient time to really review that um, RFP. Um, it's not going to really affect our timeline if we move that to the next committee, and I think I may do that versus just letting it kind of go through. Um, and we'll talk about that again, uh, propose that. And we're also gonna meet with um, uh, Lisa administration and uh, um, and other people to talk about the communication and the real process of things and the expectations of the committee going forward. And I have a resolution. Go ahead and move that, please. Okay, I'm moving the resolution uh, authorizing removal of the properties located at 300 and 308 North Tiger Street, City of Ithaca, and I move that. Is there a second? Susan seconds. Discussion. There's a lot of discussion about this, uh, and uh, uh, a name that I, an acronym I had not heard, SHPO, I think it was, uh, State Historic Preservation. Preservation. Um, and, and their, uh, their um, input uh, that they may want to have on the building of these buildings, or even knocking down buildings, uh, and also Historic Ithaca. Um, uh, we want to work with them best we can. I think the, the way I look at that is that, you know, it's a hurdle we have to, to make. I prefer to, to have those discussions early on. Um, and uh, I guess I, I hadn't really, I was a little surprised by this at the committee. Um, and it, I blame myself for not being informed um, that this would be an issue. Um, I think it was mentioned in the past. Uh, but I think we should look for their requirements ahead of time, it's what their expectations are before we get a year or two down the road and them stepping in. So I think we'll, we'll discuss that uh, in committee as well. Shana. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if there had been conversations about a parking study. Uh, not in the last meeting, if the meeting before we did. Uh, also, I th uh, um, um, and I think parking is very important. We've talked about that a lot. Um, uh, there's a, we have another parcel down the street here that would play into that. I think also um, you brought up earlier about the department placements of, of our 
you know, like the Office of Aging or whoever, is that really the right place for them? I'm not convinced it is. I think we'll, and, and as we pass that resolution for the placement departments, we all talked about that there may be some changes to that, you know, uh, as we determine if that's the, the right thing to do. I just want to make sure that we're going down parallel paths as far as um, I think it's really important for us to realize how many spots we're going to need and then ask ourselves, are, is, is parking going to be available? Is the city going to step up? Are they going to build more parking garages? Like, what is the parking situation? Because I, I know I've gone to the parking garages, they, all the spots have been filled. It, we, we can't ask our employees to keep feeding meters all day long. I, I mean, we, we have a serious parking issue here in Ithaca. And before we build a, a really expensive building, we need to make sure that we're taking care of those and, and, and we have answers to those questions. It will add the parking to, to an agenda. Okay. Mike Sigler. Don't we have a lot right down the street, though? Is that being factored in? Or? We do, and I, and I think the, in the actual um, facilities committee, um, they're going to be talking about the design of that and how many parking spaces they could get there, and, and, and I'd like to see that sooner than later, and I think that we're just waiting for the ground to kind of settle there before we, we do those improvements there. And I don't know, honey, I think it was 48 parking spaces down there. I remember, I'd forgotten the number, um, but we'll determine that, and that will be part of the equation. So. Other questions, comments, discussion? I'd like to mention something. You brought it up, but I'd like to add just a little more detail for those legislators who weren't at the meeting or the public that's listening concerning SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, what, they, what we learned is that even if we're going to take down these buildings that are not designated historic buildings, but they're in a designated historic district, that we need to go through some steps documenting what's there and maybe there's more than that. And all that has to get approved by this state office. And the reason that that's really important is because there were some examples given of funding that we can't, cannot get unless SHPO has signed off on it. So NYSEG, New York State, sorry, uh, NYSERDA, um, for the energy grants was mentioned and congressionally directed funding was mentioned. And though I'm 99% sure we are going to go after both of those pools of money in order to fund this building. So if we have to go through the state office of historic preservation in order to be eligible for those grants, that, that, that was the context that um, it came up in and that, that's why we need to pay attention to it. Any further discussion? Lee. I'm just trying to remember back to building towers and going through that process, and there were congressional earmarks, but there also could be uh, penalties against other uh, programs that are funded through the county if you're not in compliance with SHPO. Is that correct? Not just this project, but it could come back on you on other fronts um, as part of compliance, I believe. It wouldn't surprise me. I, I don't. I don't know personally, but yeah. Uh, Deborah. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned wanting to figure out what hoops we have to jump through, what I's we have to dot, what T's we have to cross before we move forward on this, um, because the way this resolution initially came to the downtown facilities committee. Um, was that um, it just talked about on line 20 to 21, final removal of the building to be completed by February 2025. Um, after discussion in our meeting, the majority of the committee voted to add the language, commencing now and proceeding with all deliberate speed. Um, I personally didn't want to see that added. I didn't think it was necessary. Um, we can commence whatever, whenever we want to. But if we're going to pass this with that language in it, I think it should be made clear publicly that we are not going to commence now and move with all due deliberate speed in disregard of the hoops, I's, and T's that we have to uh, observe to satisfy the state agencies, for example. 
Rich. Uh, Deborah, I agree with you, but that was my language that I had moved and I think Mike helped me with. Um, and the purpose was to state clear intent. We, we definitely need New York State to come along, but I think the tone and tenor of the meeting was one of a bit of surprise because we had not heard about this before and suddenly we were told that SHPO needed to be involved and there wasn't any answer on how long they would take to do anything. Um, and given the timeline we had just looked through for all the interdependent steps we need to take to build the building, um, adding an unknown element was pretty scary. So yeah, I agree with you. We don't want to do anything that would jeopardize funding or do anything that would contravene New York State requirements. But I think we have to lean on them very hard that New York State has to help us. And if, if their plan is to just sit and wait and think about it for a long time, that will hurt us. It'll hurt the taxpayers. And that was part of the discussion we had at our downtown facilities meeting. So that, was, that went into adding that language too. That th there's some urgency here. Thank you. New York will do what New York will do. Uh, no matter what we say. <laughs> well, we, we hope we can encourage them. And Dan, going back to your chair's report and, and trying to talk to our New York State representatives, I hope on this issue that we get strong support from our assembly person and our senator to advance this project in defense of our taxpayers. This will be a lot more expensive if it sits fallow for a long period of time. And we should not, any of us should be comfortable with that happening. Thanks. Mike Sigler. I pass. We're good then. Any other discussion? All right, can we have a vote please? Deborah Dawson. Yes. Rich John. Yes. Ann Corman. Yes. Mike Lane. Yes. Greg Mezzi. Yes. Veronica Miller. Yes. Lee Shirtliff. Yes. Mike Sigler. Yes. Shauna Black. Yes. Travis Brooks. Yes. Randy Brown. Yes. Campion. Yes. Free. Yes. Dan Klein. Yes. Teen Eyes. Resolution passes. Great. Thank you. Anything else from your committee or for your committee? Okay. <laughs> There are no individual member file resolutions that I'm aware of. Can someone move the minutes of the previous meeting, March 5th? Travis moves and seconds. Discussion? A vote, please. Deborah Dawson? Yes. Rich John? Yes. Ann Corman? Yes. Mike Lane? Yes. Greg Mezzi? Yes. Miller? Yes. Lee Shirtliff? Yes. Mike Sigler? Yes. Shauna Black? Yes. Travis Brooks? Yes. Randy Brown? Yes. Amanda Champion? Yes. Susan Curry? Yes. Dan Klein? Yes. 14 ayes. Minutes pass. Very good. Um, is there any un unfinished business? Okay, we're going to move into executive session. We have four items to discuss, so let me read the language that needs to be read. One item regards the discussion, discussion regarding proposed pending or current litigation. One item pro involves the proposed acquisition, sale, or lease of real property or the proposed acquisition of securities or sale or exchange of securities held by such public body, but only when publicity would substantially affect the value thereof. And then we have two items concerning the medical, financial, credit, or employment history of a particular person or corporation, or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person or corporation. Can I have a motion to go into executive session, please? Travis moves, is there a second? Veronica seconds discussion. All in favor of going into executive session? Yes, we got to do it. We got to do a roll call. Sorry. Austin. Yes. Rich John. Yes. Ian Corman. Yes. Mike Lane. Yes. Greg Mezzi. Yes. Pillar. Yes. Lee Shirtliff. Yes. Mike Sigler. Yes. Shauna Black. Yes. Travis Brooks. Yes. Randy Brown. Yes. Amanda Champion. Yes. Susan Curry. Yes. Dan Klein. Yes. 14 eyes.
Okay, in just a minute, we will go, we will shut down the cameras and all that, take a few minutes to switch over. We do not expect to take any action when we come out of executive session.